This is the Rich Eisen Show. David Aldridge of The Athletic here uh, on the Rich Eisen Show. Heard nationwide, televised online at richeisenshow.com. It's very difficult right now for me to be all about, you know, sports is important and we need to get back and open everything up. It's very difficult, you know, with everything that's going on in our country. Live from the Rich Eisen Show studio in Los Angeles, today's guests... Basketball Hall of Famer Kareem Abdul Jabbar, plus Pro Football Hall of Famer Ed Reed. And now, it's Rich Eisen. Hey, it's Rich Eisen here live uh, in our Los Angeles studios. Uh, we say hello to our friends on YouTube.com and the uh, wormhole, all the 454s out there who are with us on this Tuesday. Uh, we say thank you, everybody listening on Sirius XM Channel 211. Good to see Chris Brockman and Mike hey, Del Tufo right, in their man. usual spots you. over there. And we're back in our usual spot. Um, as uh, all of you out there probably either gathered or either you saw our tweet yesterday or you gathered it uh, when you gathered in your usual spot to uh, take on uh, and take in this show um, that uh, we weren't on the air yesterday and just want to walk you through uh, all that. Um, we here in Los Angeles, California, are uh, under what is a nightly curfew now. Uh, many parts of this uh, great city uh, receiving alerts on our phones every um, every night now that um, that let us know that we we need to be staying at home. And the reason why is there's a there's a lot of looting going on in our great city. There's a lot of um, civil unrest going on. And we thought, based on what we saw over the weekend, seeing it in spots of this city that uh, I've lived here for 17 years, uh, I've never seen. And even those that did live here during the uh, riots that followed the Rodney King beating uh, in the streets of Los Angeles, that there are parts of L.A. that hadn't seen this sort of activity. And uh, so we decided to just be safe and and sit, sit yesterday uh, at home. So we're back. And we're appreciative of you being there, and we're thrilled to be here for you, even though um, I'm going to be very, I'm going to be very honest with you. I always am. I wear my heart on my sleeve here all the time. Otherwise, why do this? For the first time in my career, and uh, I've been fortunate to be here in front of a microphone or in any front of an, any microphone for about a, a quarter century now. Um, I kind of don't know what to say. I kind of don't know what you want to hear. I kind of don't know what type of show you'd like to sit in front of your computers to see. Or when you maybe sit in front of a television on NBCSN when we're joined in the second and third hours with Kareem, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Ed Reed joining us. I, I kind of don't know what you're into. Uh, if you want to escape everything or you're too outraged by what you've seen that it's too important what's going out in the world to escape and my first inclination is the latter that what we're seeing out in the streets of our amazing country that's being torn apart by hatred and racism bullying by people who hate, want to divide because they don't know any other language, don't know any other emotion, or they're comforted by knowing that others who hate and divide think like them, which disturbs me. And striking the right chord from somebody in my position, I'm not an expert on on many of the subjects that rule the day right now. I'm not an expert on all of this. But I, I do know this. We can be outraged by what happened on the streets of Minneapolis now a week ago. We can call it murder because that's what it was. 
we can desire justice, seek justice, need justice. The other three police officers who were involved in the George Floyd murder should be taken into custody, should be charged, should be put on trial. We can think that. We can also think that the police officers who were involved in this murder are outliers, that there are many excellent police officers out there. And even though what we're seeing on our Twitter feed, which outrages, what we're seeing in streets of this great country where peaceful protests are escalated by the activity of law enforcement. We could sit here and think that that's the norm. There are also moments that I see on my Twitter feed of police officers who do act in a manner that they are sworn to act, that they do want to police and protect and serve as they have been sworn to act, that they do want to hear what is on the hearts and minds of those who take to the streets peacefully protesting. We can all think that. We can also think that peaceful protest, that disruptions and mass protests are legitimate actions and warranted in this situation. We could think that. Peaceable assembly in this country, that's what the founding fathers demanded. That's what the founding fathers wrote into our nation of laws. We can't sit here and think that peaceable assembly is necessary, warranted, that people who do take to the streets peaceably to let everyone know what's going on is unacceptable, that that peaceable assembly is acceptable, and that when we do see vigilantism on the streets of our country who feel safe and taking to the streets with bats, and guns, and weapons. We can't sit here and think that that is unlawful. And I understand there are laws that do allow open carry in this great country of ours, but they don't allow you to intimidate. And that the people who peaceably assemble in the streets aren't asking to be run over by cars or threatened. We can also think that looting and burning businesses is reprehensible and people who do that should be taken to account, arrested, and also should go to jail. We can sit here and think that looting and taking advantage of a rightful cause is reprehensible and they should be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law in an equally, in a, just, in a justice system where it is all applied equally. We can't sit here and be outraged by that and sit here and think that this is actually feeding the fire of all those that I said at the very top are in fact rooting for there to be a problem on the streets so they can go and bust skulls and have the political cover for it? We can't sit here and think that peaceable assembly is undercut by those who take advantage of it? The bad actors that are out there? 
I'm scared. I'm not going to lie. I'm scared. I'm scared for my family. I'm scared for my children. I'm scared for this country. I'm scared for the way that we are treating one another. Or how comfortable people are treating people with a lack of empathy and respect. We have lost the value of empathy. The concept of empathy and sympathy in this country in some parts is viewed as weak. And I say to people who say that, no, you are weak because you can't extend a hand. You are weak if you go out on the streets and say, I'm going to bust some skulls today because I feel angry. I feel repressed, even though you have basically, by the color of your skin, a leg up in this country. I say, you are weak. And it pains me to have this sort of anger. I sat here in this chair in December, and I retweeted it over the weekend when my dad passed away. God rest his soul. Asking everybody to pull together, reach out, love. So damn tough about it. Looking at the color of somebody's skin and thinking they're less than. Who the hell are you? It's a human being we're talking about. It bleeds and loves and wants and desires just like everybody else. How tough is it to ask somebody, what's on your mind? How can I help? How can I be a part of the solution? And I'll be honest, it's awful tough to do that when the highest individual in our country is tear gassing people who are peaceably assembling just so he can stroll across the street, grab a Bible, and hold it upside down. And I know that pisses off a lot of people for me to say that, but I'm telling you what, it's difficult. But we've got to overcome it. People at the highest levels have to go and say, what is on your mind? What can we do to help? We know you're pissed that a cop, somebody who was ordained by a a, a municipality in this country, took a knee and put it on the neck of an individual for nine minutes. Nine minutes almost. A third of which apparently, based on a coroner's report, he was unconscious. Think about that. I've been on the air for 13 minutes. Think about that tonight. And it's okay to think about it. And it's okay to be angry about it. But eventually, we've got to come together. We have to. Right now, all these businesses that we are so concerned about because of COVID-19 open up, open up the country. They're boarded up. I feel for all these folks. I saw a pharmacy looted in Van Nuys, California. Van Nuys. Yes, the home of where you see all these movies on your (laughs) internet. I don't know what you're talking Uh about, man. I don't know what you're talking about. Van Nuys, California. The pharmacy, I'm sure this pharmacy was open day in, day out as an essential business during COVID-19. Looted and burned. I watched it happen on live television. Looted and burned. We're all concerned about these businesses. They need to open up. We've got to let these people make their money. We all do. Now they're boarded up. Because for some reason, there's three individuals in the city of Minneapolis that are still strolling around. When they watch somebody keep a a knee on the neck of an individual for nine minutes because he was passing phony money on a Memorial Day night, allegedly. As if that's reason for the, the, he was in the car and they took him out of the car. He was already subdued. They took him out and then put there. 
knee on his neck. And we're still angry for many reasons. And until somebody in power and people with microphones continues to talk up and ask, how can we help? What can we do? This is all going to keep going. And I will say this again. Looting is reprehensible. I am so as angry as I am about much of what I've talked about. Not all, because nothing's worse than murder. I'm angry when I see these businesses looted because I see hardworking individuals have their livelihoods go up in smoke and people using this as an excuse to break the law. And I'm angry. And I'm pissed. But we have to wonder why and how can we fix the problem? And people in positions of power must take the lead. And until then, I'll sit here best I can, talk some sports in life, and this is part of life and find out what can we do. And that's what I will ask of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who wrote a remarkable op-ed piece over the weekend about this subject matter. And that's what I will ask Ed Reed, who apparently has on his mind something that Instagram is doing that's uh, kind of taking him and Reggie Wayne, they're doing you know, a cigar bar Instagram live feed every night. I guess there, something's going on with Instagram. He wants to get off his chest too. I called him. I mean, I Susie can't, and I, I Susie, can't wait. Susie I can't wait knew Ed, Ed again. How many times I say Susie knew Ed before I knew Ed? That happens a lot. She's known people a lot longer because she you. covered him in college. Right. For you, baby. So I got to meet Ed Reed, and we called him. We called him. How you doing, Ed? We love you. I have nothing but love for this man. And when I look at him, I don't see the color of his skin. That's what I'm trying to teach my children at home. So I don't know if everybody out there in YouTube land who just heard all that, or Sirius XM who just heard all that, that's what you wanted to hear today. But I had to say it, sitting at home, seeing my country go up and smoke Worried if my children, 11, 9, and 6, are going to grow up in a world where I don't recognize it. One of the things we'll ask Kareem as well is the passing of Wes Unseld, who passed away today. He was 74. Well, his name was mentioned quite a bit last October, too, because the great city of Washington, D.C., that had military helicopters over it last night, and a general in fatigue strolling the street like it's a movie, they won a World Series championship. That feels like a million years ago. But Wes Unseld's name was mentioned because he was a champion Washington Bullet. Watching the news over the weekend, it just a crossover pop culture. It felt like Back to the Future too, where everything was just crazy and they're just people driving down the street, <laughs> shooting and chaos everywhere. It was terrifying. It was. It felt like a movie. It felt like we weren't watching real life. Yeah, I, I know. And I just don't know again of what people are interested in hearing or not. But it's just difficult for me to have anger in my voice and in my heart because of what I counseled everybody here. And I want to be about it, you know? I want to talk about it. I want to be about it, about loving 
reaching across empathy, sympathy. Those are not weaknesses. Those are strengths. Those are strengths. That's what that's what I want you to teach your your little boy. I've been thinking about it a lot over the weekend. I mean, has, has just real brief has fatherhood changed the way you look at this uh, stuff? No question. No question. Not um, that you'd think, uh, you know, other. I, I, no, no, definitely. But uh, you know, I was the guy who, you know, said, well, "Be strong. Do it yourself. You don't have to rely on people." You know. Uh, yeah. People should take care of themselves first and foremost. And I think in the last three months, I've I've really, I've really, really changed the way. It's I, really I feel just it's, again. Uh, I I I'm uh, just wanted to speak from the heart to start this show. And I'm pleased to have joining us right now. I've never met this man, but um, I'm I'm appreciative of him calling in. I enjoyed watching him tell some of his stories in the Last Dance. He is the Catherine and Frank Price Endowed Chair for the Study of Race and Popular Culture and the Professor of Cinema and Media Studies at the USC School of Cinematic Arts. He's also known as Dr. B or the notorious PhD. He's Dr. Todd Boyd here on the Rich Eisen Show. Dr. Boyd, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. You bet. I will, I, I will give you the floor. What is going on in your mind today, Dr. Boyd? <laughs> I know. Um, well, there's a lot going on. It's hard to... Uh even uh, narrow it down to one or two things. Um, we're living in an interesting moment. Uh, you know, we've all been uh, inside our houses for the last few months because of uh, COVID, and, you know, uh, uh, that was traumatic and disruptive enough, um, something I had never uh, <laughs> experienced in my life. And uh, on the heels of that, um, as that is uh, seeming to say slowly wind down or something of that nature um we have a situation um you know that we've seen numerous times now so much that people know the names of these victims who've been killed on camera and they circulate in our society and um you know several of them one right after the other and uh and then you know people's response to it over the last week uh <clears throat> in the streets so there's a lot going on, um, you know, and uh, you try to make sense of it, but you have to live through it at the same time. So uh, you were, if I'm not mistaken, you were a native Detroiter, right? From, yes, you're, sir. A Michi- you're a Michigander, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. So um, does part of you, are you shocked, surprised at all that we're still having the same conversation that I'm sure you were hearing or seeing on the streets of Detroit as you were growing up there, Dr. Boyd? Um, I'm not surprised at all. I'm actually not even uh, so phased by it, honestly, because, uh, you know, if you're fortunate enough to uh, get some years behind you in this life, you see a lot of things. Um, When I was uh, very, very young, um, you know, Detroit in the late 1960s had a very famous uh, riot, uprising, rebellion, uh, whichever uh, uh, choice of terminology you you decide on. Um, And it was very profound because, of course, you know, in this moment, um, the city became, in essence, a new city because, you know, this uh, phenomenon sociologists call white flight. Uh, You know, uh, white people left Detroit and moved to the suburbs. Detroit became an entirely black city, black uh, mayor, um, you know, uh, just black in its identity. you know, but I remember my father telling me stories about going to the World Series in 68 and, uh, you know, Marvin Gaye sang the national anthem and he sang it in a very traditional way, quite different than he did in the 80s in Los Angeles when, mm-hmm. you know, that famous performance at the Forum at the All-Star Game. But he saw Jose Feliciano sing the national anthem and Jose Feliciano was booed because, of course, he sang the national anthem in his own style. And my father, um, who wasn't familiar with Jose Feliciano's music, but just couldn't abide by the fact that they were booing this man and, you know, throwing things at him. And he just he just really, you know, he says, hey, the man did his own thing, and um, this is your response. So, you know, I, I grew up in an environment where, uh, you know, in that time and immediately after in the 70s, I mean, so, so many things, Nixon era, um, 
you know, poverty, crime, drugs, all those uh, things we can tick off. And, uh, you know, uh, Los Angeles in the early 90s, um, you know, has come up uh, also quite a bit lately. So, you know, when you live through this enough, you see it, and it takes different shapes and forms. But if the root causes don't change, then you can expect, you know, a recurrence. And I think that's what we're seeing now. People just have a, a really stronger response to it and, um, at the same time, you're able to see it spread out on social media in ways that mm. um, you were not able to see in times previous. So it, it's different in that regard, but in other ways, it's the same. No doubt, Doctor Boyd. I'm sitting there, you know, um, you know, and it's it's. I've got three kids at home cooped up. They're already cooped up because of you know COVID, and now you know they're hearing that awful alarm go off on my phones at night wondering if you know something's happening um and i tell them something is happening out there and i look down at my phone and i'm trying to be present for them but i can't be i am be very honest refreshing my phone and just seeing one horrific scene after another wind up in the palm of my hand and it just makes me wonder if everything is going to hell and what what can i do what what can we do uh, you know, I, I know you're laughing, but that, that's, that is essentially what I want to ask many of my, my guests today. I'm a 50-year-old Jewish white man. I, I've, I've never been pulled from a car. I've never been pulled over because of the color of my skin. I've never, I've never ever had a, a knee on my neck. I've never had that. I, so I'm, I'm kind of wondering how I can join hands here and what we can do together. Well, you know, I've been uh, answering that question a lot, uh, certainly over the last few days. I don't know if my answers have been sufficient, um, you know, but I think in some ways it's like, um, you know, whenever there's an emergency, you know, people scramble to deal with the emergency, but perhaps that's not the uh, preparation um, or execution that you want to have um, you know, in general, when there's an emergency, you have to act. But if you plan and execute otherwise, you might be able to prevent the emergency. So we, we're in an emergency phase. We've gotten past what we could have done. It's kind of hard right now to say what you can do. Um, you know, I mean, we have to let these things play out. But what I've also been saying to people is, and this sounds simple, I don't know, people sometimes ask that question. and It's like they want, you know, the sort of... <laughs> Uh, miraculous answer do this and everything will be okay but of course it doesn't work that way right um i I think you know as i keep saying to people it it starts with people educating themselves really uh which is a fairly simple sounding thing it's more difficult than that to execute but it really comes down to education and um, knowing that we live in a society that has often sold itself as a great society, but of course it was not great for everyone. Um, America's often sold itself as a great nation, but it's not been great for everyone. It's been great for some people. Um, and the attitude has been, if it's not great for you, then that's your fault. Um, when you know there are inequities and inequalities built into a system that has benefited people differently based on you know, their identity. And so when we think about, like, what all that means, if you don't know that this exists, then you look at a situation and you say, you know, why would a police officer break the law? Their job is to uphold the law. And you just don't believe that, you know, a police officer would do something um, so reprehensible in spite of the fact that they may have done it. I think they call it cognitive dissonance. Um, But if you don't have that, uh, knowledge and education, if you have no empathy and are unable to live in other people's shoes, at least vicariously, then, you know, nothing ever changes because you only look at it a certain way. So that's what I mean when I say educate yourself. Um, that's where it starts. And then from that, um, you know, recognize that we live in a society that um, is still very divided and there are numerous uh, disadvantages and long-standing issues that consistently need addressing um you know i think that's where we have to start um even though it looks like maybe um it's a bit late to be doing so right now but that's really what it's about dr todd boyd of the usc professor of cinema media studies race and popular culture as well right here 
on the Rich Eisen Show. What, what if sports were going on right now, right? What if sports were? Uh, I mean, we're seeing we're seeing statements um, from from the biggest names in all of sports. But what, what, you know, what if what if we actually if there was no COVID nineteen and and there'd be games tonight? Hmm. What do you think? Uh, I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> um, I, I think. In some ways, some of what we've seen transpire in the streets over the last week is directly due to the fact that people have been, you know, cooped up in the house um, for the last few months. A lot of this is beyond politics or ideology. <laughs> you know, people are restless, I think, which is uh, kind of uh, ironic um, and funny in a, you know, strange way. But I think that's part of it. Uh, so, if, you know, if there's no COVID and we've been watching sports for the last few months, I mean, like, it's normal. Um, and, uh, you know, who knows what the reaction is. I think there'd still be a strong reaction to these videos of, you know, joggers getting killed by private citizens in Georgia and, you know, police putting their necks on individuals in Minneapolis and, you know, women getting killed in Louisville, et cetera. I mean, those things would prompt a... Uh, a response. I guess I, I guess I'm di- not to interrupt, but I guess I asked the question poorly. Um, well, I guess the way I'm saying is we've seen so many times the sports take the lead in this country uh, okay. on showing how people should act and react. Or, right? I mean that we've uh, in, in a, a perfect example that you know so many people wouldn't even think of quarantining. Yeah, well, let's let's shut down the economy until Rudy Gobert of the Utah Jazz tested positive mm-hmm. for coronavirus, and and then the sports league started shutting down in ways that we didn't get from leadership on the federal level right right. so i guess that would be the way that uh, i'm i'm framing the question i'm i'm thinking i'm thinking though um you know and perhaps you remember this back in 92 um the riots following the rodney king verdict and uh, nba playoffs were going on um and it felt at that time as though the playoffs took a back seat the playoffs were secondary um in that moment um i mean obviously sports plays such a prominent role in our society and athletes are very visible um i think had sports uh not stopped were it still going on mm-hmm. um you know people would be able to see athletes in what we might call their natural habitat they wouldn't just be at home like we all are but instead would be participating in their sports and you know interviews and press conferences there'd be a lot more dialogue and opportunities to participate in shaping the narrative. I don't think athletes would control it, uh, but I think they could certainly participate in, in um, you know, enhancing the narrative in a way that's, you know, not gone on just because of the circumstances of, uh, of COVID. So imagining that would be a different way of thinking about how you could, particularly in the age of social media, when athletes are able to, you know, reach their followers directly. Um, I think you could imagine a different set of circumstances, um, but at the same time, the magnitude of the events uh, may very well have trumped athletics, at least for a time. So uh, did any of the statements from any of the players stand out um, to you where you thought that that was particularly profound or surprising that the voice it came from at all? Well, I've noticed I, I, what, what has caught my attention, not necessarily one or two statements or any statements that have been necessarily um, profound. But I think what has attracted my attention is the volume of statements. There's been a large number of statements from, you know, corporations, institutions, as well as individuals. Um, And in each of these, I've seen people who have commented on uh, police brutality of, you know, African-Americans, being killed, uh, solidarity with black people, the tone and the sentiment and the volume of them has, uh, you know, caught my attention more so than any, you know, individual statements. It seems to be uh, more pervasive uh, throughout society. I mean, if you go on Instagram today, people are blacking out their page. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, so I I guess I feel like um, this is uh, interesting what's transpiring, but there's a lot of people who seem to be on the right side of this in larger numbers than maybe uh, we've seen in the past. That's what's caught my 
my attention more so than um, the substance of anybody's statement so far. And uh, Dr. Todd Boyd uh, uh, here on the Rich Eisen Show, and many uh, of my listeners and viewers may recognize the voice face uh, also from the documentary The Last Dance that was quite popular uh, over a, a five-week period on, on ESPN. Um, and, you know, how, how about the fact that it's 2020 and Jordan is putting out a statement uh, on this subject that he is still considered one of the titans of our sports world and it is now oh gosh almost two decades since he's actually laced him up dr boyd well you know when you talk about uh mike i mean you're talking about one of the uh you know maybe two or three most popular athletes in american history um so you know that's a a uh, very lofty status. I think, uh, you know, one of the things that came up on the last dance was that conversation about, you know, Mike's refusal to uh, or desire not to endorse Harvey Gantt back in the early 90s yes. when he was running against Jesse Helms. Um, you know, I think uh, knowing what he knows now, he recognizes that that was a missed opportunity. And I think what we've seen from him since that time on a number of issues has been at least, um, you know, more public uh, association um, with political issues through statements, through donations, through things of this nature. Um, you know, but uh, everybody's sitting up in the house because of COVID and uh, ESPN moves up, you know, the last yes. dance documentary. Um, everybody's watching and talking about it. It almost felt to me like we were back in that era when there were only three networks and everybody was watching yeah. the same thing. <laughs> um, it's rare that, you know, everybody's sort of zoned in on, you know, one show. Um, I think that broke up the boredom, and uh, it also increased the number of people who want to know uh, who the maker of my eyeglasses are. So. <laughs> <laughs> that, well, I mean, you want to uh, you you throw know, that? You, you want to throw that? You want to throw that out there and answer the question? I mean, well, um, uh, you know, I have not answered the question because with me, as I'm sure you can yes. tell, just in our conversation, it's never yes or no. It's never simple. Yes. So uh, I'm going to be quiet for now, and then I'm going to hold a decision like uh, press conference the way LeBron did and make the announcement. <laughs> okay. That's what I've decided well, if you, to do. If you want me to play the role of uh, of Jim Gray, I'll do that for your. Let's, uh, let's, your, let's do it, man. Let's more, do it. Be more than happy to do that. Did you learn anything from that documentary? Is there something that you picked up from that that you did not know or needed a question answered? I wouldn't say I learned anything because I have uh, been studying, uh, you know, that era and those times, and I've written books about it and. Um, been immersed in it. I lived it, you know. Um, yes. First time I met, uh, you know, Mike was back in Detroit in the late 80s um, after watching him uh, unfortunately give uh, my Pistons 59 points on Easter <laughs> Sunday. Um, you know, that was uh, that was back in the late 80s. So, you know, having lived it and, uh, of course, the work I do having studied it, um, there's not much to learn. It was nice to, at least for me, because I try to be on top of that, but it was nice to relive all that. Um, and I guess if I had one favorite moment that yes. didn't involve myself, yes, um, it was watching Mike laugh at Gary Payton, and this the way he said the glove with that question mark and exclamation point at the end of it. Um, just that response is, is, to me, that's the documentary right there. Like, you know, the glove uh, um, as he looks at that iPad. But, you know, there's a lot of moments in there that are funny and kind of nice to uh, relive all that. I, I think it was, a, you know, an excellent presentation. And I think it did a lot, you know, for the people who watched it in terms of dealing with uh, the monotony that, you know, sort of COVID had brought into our lives. No question about it. And uh, I, I I, had David Aldridge on the show Friday, Dr. Boyd, and I said to him, you know, at least you weren't one of those people on the iPad handed to Jordan. You did not want to be that person <laughs> when that happened during the doc. That was the last thing you wanted to be was the person on an iPad that Jason Hare, the director, handed to Jordan for his perusal. Yes. And immediate no, you... reaction. And uh, by the way, that I would take an 11th episode of all the cutting room floor moments i'm sure not all the ipad moments being handed to michael made it on the air i would imagine right. you know right. well, I, you could e you could easily do the 
making of The Last Dance. Um, you know, that'd be interesting as well. And could you imagine if there was in uh, social media when Rodman was playing, Dr. Boyd? Could you imagine what that would have been like? The entire time I'm watching the documentary, I just kept thinking if all of this had transpired during the era of social media, I mean, Rodman would have certainly demanded attention. But, you know, to have lived through that myself with no social media now, you know, recognizing how the world has changed because of social media. Um, I mean, Rodman marrying himself in the age of social media, I mean, that would have most certainly broken the Internet, as they say, Um it's kind of hard to imagine, but at the same time, um, when you think about that era, you know, you think about the fact that there was no social media, and here we are, you know, 20 plus years later, and it's like it just happened yesterday. So that speaks to, you know, how those moments uh, cemented themselves in our culture and our history. The fact that, you know, we're still into it, um, you know, so many years having passed. Um, you know, a lot of people do things that in the moment they're popular, and then, you know, particularly now, 24-hour news cycle, there's a new story every day. Um, but you look at that, and you're like, this happened 22, you know, 30 years ago, depending on the episode and the segment, and we're still talking about it. So that tells us how important it is to our culture. No doubt. So my last question for you, Dr. Borden, I appreciate the time this morning. Um, a show like this one at the crossroads of pop culture, sports, life, um, you are at the crossroads of race and popular culture. What do you think shows like this one should be like um, moving forward here over the next day, two, three, two, three weeks uh, in terms of, you know, people? I, I'm, I'm curious as a host of a show like this one, what you think should be the topic of conversation here? Well, those things you mentioned, you talk about popular culture, you talk about race. I mean, um, I've always, you know, focused on popular culture because popular culture is something we as a society enjoy, um, you know. But through popular culture, through sports, you know, there's so much more going on, you know. Sports has been one of the most visible areas in our society in terms of the issue of race for a long time, you know. Um, so there's ways to talk about political issues, racial issues, um, and sports issues, um, cultural issues, um, societal issues. I mean, these things are all connected. A lot of times people try to separate them in their own lanes. You know, sports and politics don't mix, but sports and politics are life, and they do mix. And I think the conversation has to be, as you've done um, through sports, that's what you do, but you use that as an opportunity to talk about, you know, bigger issues, um, more profound issues. Sports is just the introduction, the intro, but you go from there into something that talks about ultimately American society, our country, the culture. I mean, sports, popular culture, that's the surface, but we're going deeper. And I think that emphasis on going deeper and how this explains our society at this time is the way um, perhaps you could consider proceeding. Okay. I appreciate the uh, the advice, the thoughts. Uh, if you ever have, a, I guess, a class on, um, you know, the, the um, what would you say, the, the issue of sticking to sports, um, <laughs> I, I'd be happy to, to speak to your class. I get, that, <laughs> I get that response quite a bit on my social media feeds, hashtag stick to sports, all that <laughs> stuff, stick to the NFL, all that sort of business. Right. I get that a lot. So, right, I um, can imagine. <laughs> Thank you for the time, Dr. Boyd. Really appreciate it, and I hope your family is healthy, well, and safe. Thank you, sir. Thank you. That's uh, Dr. Todd Boyd here on The Rich Eisen Show. Figured we'd get him on here and be our first guest. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Ed Reed as well. And you, if you want to call us, 844-204-RICH, number to dial here on this edition of The, uh, the Rich Eisen Show. Um, there is some news that happened over the weekend, or I guess yesterday. Baseball putting out there. Is that, again, anything you're hearing from the world of baseball right now is um, being thrown out there for all of us to to chew on. And Jeff Passan, who's been breaking a ton of news, he and Carl Ravitch together yesterday on ESPN, reporting that baseball. If the conversations between them and uh, the players do not uh, yield an agreement, right, 
then baseball is not going to just throw its hands up and say, we're done. See you in 2021. Well, that's good news. What they will do is unilaterally throw in a 50-game schedule prorating the salaries of players in the manner in which players said in March, this is that's what this whole conversation is, hey, you've been – you, you agreed to prorate our salaries based on the number of games that are played. Now you're saying we've got to take less than that because there's no fans in the stands and you get 40% of your revenue with fannies in the seats. And as we've heard, the biggest mother load is the playoffs. That's where they make most of their money. And, and so um, I thought to myself, well, that seems like good news, right? Seems like it. Seems like good news. Then you read deeper into it. And when you hear the word unilateral, usually not very good. <laughs> um, I guess to use, you're seeing a lot of unilateral on the streets of, uh, of our country right now. And doing the math, the, the way that if they prorate the salaries. Over 50 games? Over 50 games. Right. Players would make only 30% of their 2020 salaries. The players' current proposal as they made over the weekend was 100, it, 114 games. 114 games uh, ending on Halloween night with the World Series. That's a lot of games. Like, I think we would have had to start that like five minutes ago. It's a lot of games. It's a lot of games. And it gets them 70% of their salary. It gets them 70% of the salary. So do the math. What's in the what's in the middle? 50-50. I know. Which is what the owners are saying you guys everybody should take. And the players are saying they don't want that. Or they consider that to be less of a less of so if what's in the middle is what's currently what baseball players want, which is like an 82-game schedule where you prorate our salaries, baseball's only willing to do 50 games of that. So if what's in between in terms of the revenue is an 82-game schedule fully prorated and baseball's already said they don't want to do that, so then what's the middle where we can come to an agreement? Now, in terms of can baseball just unilaterally do it, according to these articles that I'm seeing, that in the language of that March agreement, the commissioner can institute a schedule on his own after a good faith negotiation is done. Do you believe this negotiation is a good uh, faith? And that's another <laughs> that's another thing that again, I'm just hoping this doesn't go in front of a an arbiter of some sort. I mean, you either want to play this year or I you, think everybody or wants to play. I think everybody legitimately wants to play. I mean, Jeff Passan told us last week he thinks that, there are owners that, that don't. That don't. Well, they want to eat it. And then in the same way, again, to just see it, society is just like, all right, so everybody, you, you crack heads. You crack heads and get peace. And, and you, then what? Then how do you live? Then what? Like, what society are you leaving after that way to, like, yes, you were able to walk from the White House to the church. But what's the society that's now left behind because you achieved what you wanted to achieve? So, yeah, to the owners who are like, we don't need 2020. Great. So you didn't lose all what you thought you'd lose and you didn't lose your what? Your gumption. You didn't lose your you, you saved face. Then what? Then what happens in 2021? Because we're going to hear the NBA make announcements soon and i think any the nhl's coming too yeah we're seeing soccer we're 100 i feel like i'm a broken record we're 100 days from the nfl kickoff like we are indeed it's coming you know one thing that we will discuss because again you just heard dr boyd say yeah i mean there's there's a lot of what's going on in the real world out there but there is some sports Tonight on NBCSN at 8 Eastern time, the review, the re-air of Al and Chris at the mic, New England versus Seattle. 
Oh, yeah. All right. I know what I'm doing tonight. Do you think you know what you're doing tonight? At, I think I know what I'm doing tonight At 5 o'clock now. Pacific? Fantastic. At 8 Eastern time? Oh, my gosh. And, I again, I don't know. Usually when these games get reared of uh, in college sports, we've been seeing, like, did you see, and we'll, we'll hit this again later on, when I think they re-aired, they, I don't know, must have been some some network re-aired Miami versus Ohio State. Oh, yeah. I saw everyone live tweeting that. And the reason why I knew it was on is because Dan Fouts was trending. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor Fouts. What did he say? Well, no, I, he, a lot of people were accusing him of openly rooting for Miami in the game. Oh. Miami got screwed. They did. <laughs> got, they got really screwed on that one. That was Ken Dorsey, Willis McGahee, right? It was, it was that, Ken Dorsey, it was yeah. Those teams? yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They got hosed. That was Trestle's national championship. I watched Friday night NBC SN, you know, showing all the old Saturday Night Lives that Michael Jordan hosted Saturday. That's one of the greatest episodes ever. Well, him with the future senator from the state of Minnesota, I mean, Al Franken, the, doing, doing the Stuart, the Stuart Smalley, Smalley is just, the daily reaffirmation. And then uh, that was the Bulls. That was Chris Farley having the Baker's dozen heart attacks. Like, oh, it was so oh, was great. that right? Oh yeah. Joe's George went doing the the Swarovski brothers. That was that night with, with yeah. Jordan. Yeah, they're wearing hula skirts and they switch over to the Bulls. Like <laughs> it's amazing. A hundred days to the NFL season opens up, huh? Yeah. Well, we'll see if they have uh, again. That's scheduled. That's scheduled. It's crazy. It's just amazing how everything. It's it's as if COVID nineteen in the world. We're not even Stopped talking about it right I mean. now. We're not even discussing it right now. And I think that may be the point. Right. Man, I just don't want to get political. I don't want to get do all that. Uh, I'm, I'm, it's just very difficult. And, you know, you got your little ba- baby boy at home. I got these three kids who are now who are, have voice and ask me what's going on. How have you been explaining we have it? We have flat out been telling them. I mean, they saw the graffiti on the walls in Beverly Hills. Yeah. And Santa Monica, they've seen it. They see the they they see everything that's out there in Los Angeles. They go to the Grove a lot, where I used to a live car right bur- over there. A, a cop car burned two days ago. Hmm. But mostly, we we leave the television off in the house. But we tell them what's going on in the world. I never thought I'd ask you a question like this today, but we don't have a poll question today, do we? I mean, we got to. No, I mean, I can. All right, so we got Kareem up. I can whip one up. I don't know. I mean, I don't know what's to discuss right now. I don't don't either. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is going to be joining us. Ed Reed's going to be joining us as well. Ed, we called, Susie and I called him up, and he's just, he was the one who who said, hey, how about I call him, we chop it up. We didn't even discuss. So whatever's on Ed's mind is going to be on Ed's mind. And he was saying yesterday, he, you know, he and Reggie Wayne are having a nightly Instagram live cigar bar. That's awesome. Where he lights one up and Reggie Wayne lights one up and they just they light just the whole thing up. And, and I think he was saying something along the lines that the amount of time that he's allowed to be on live has been cut because he's playing music. Oh. And he probably doesn't have a, right, Mike? He doesn't have a license to yeah, you can't play. Or you a, have to play or anything. Yeah, you can't play. Yeah. Anything that's licensed. On unless- Instagram live? Facebook and Instagram. So they're cracking down on that. Oh, they've been doing that forever. Have they? Yeah. Well, they, Facebook, they I it, can't do my show they on made Facebook. exceptions for a for couple of DJs. And recently, couple of DJs but, do yeah, it. But, yeah, but like, they're like. Oh, yeah. is that why? Because. That's why I'm on. Yeah, that's why I'm not on when, Facebook. Because when, um, when the quarantine first hit, Susie had, there was like a, a, a move around dance, you know, workout that she had the kids do just because we wanted to move the kids around couldn't go outside for various reasons and the guy was playing commercial music and they did it for like an hour yeah yeah it's like they usually shut you down in like a certain amount so ed wants to talk about that i love ed you never know what's gonna come out of his mouth but you know it's gonna be poignant oh man 
All right, so we've got two more hours to go here on this uh, Tuesday edition of the Rich Eisen Show. And, um, you know, I'll always shoot you straight. Um, and my thoughts, what's in my thoughts, and my heart, and my mind, and also my lower back, which uh, is totally seized up. And I don't know how I got through this first hour, but I'll do it. I'll be walking around like Fred G. Sanford in the commercial <laughs> break. You guys might have to help me sit right back down. I actually asked Chris Brockman to pick something up off the floor when you I walked in and dropped in something on the floor. You walked in and like... Can you go uh, pick, pick something, something up, up for me? <laughs> and you, you probably were like, what, like at the store? I was like, you need like, me to run? No. Coffee? Donut? I can't play the Sanford and Son theme. Please don't. <laughs> I'll do it for you. Oh, that's funny. One of my favorite don't. shows of all time. Oh, man. I'm seeing like some top 10 lists. People talking like top 10 lists. I guess, I don't know, we weren't on the air yesterday. So I think many people got uh, shows like this addressed the issues at hand but it seems to be changing every two seconds i haven't looked at my twitter feed in, in an hour is the world still spinning outside it's still going barely it's still going kareem abdul jabbar ed reed and you 844-204 rich we'll take your phone calls on nbcsn uh they're waiting for us and uh just want to let you know our friends at geico are there for you right now um geico.com slash give back they want to make sure that you understand that it is that uh, time of year and that you are sharing as much as you're sharing on social media that they want to give you 15% off. So go to geico.com slash give back to learn more on that front. Podcast1.com slash Rich Eisen for our podcast. NBC when we come back. I have a lot of confidence in Coach Coach Pagano. All right, let's move to uh, a little bit more of an omnibus portion of our conversation here, Coach Matt Nagy. First things first, uh, pass interference now being challenging. Now you can review this stuff, but... Let's do this! Bye-bye, Mike. Look it up. Omnibus, an adjective pertaining to, including, or dealing with numerous objects or items at one time. Omnibus, shopping for my big Sunday dinner, I had an omnibus grocery list. I bet you did. Big word alert. Big word alert. I would love nothing more than to ask him, like, normal, really pointed questions as a Knicks fan that I want answers to, to try and have a rapprochement between him and Oakley and have and 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 bring them together so i can what? feel comfortable about going back to the garden oh my gosh i'm more than happy to have him sit in this chair i wouldn't i wouldn't i wouldn't badger the witness as far as the knicks are as far as i'm concerned with the sports teams let him go get him out of there i'm telling the shareholders of msg you don't want this guy making decisions so let him go play with this harmonica let him go but you need him Unless they're saying for him to pay that much money at the very, for himself that much money, at the very least, he needs to put down the harmonica. So I understand if you're a shareholder and you're like, that's an absurd amount of money. But Oh my God. Rob Proshma, a noun meaning the establishment or re-establishment of harmonious relations. Reproach, bro. After my crazy ex-wife threw one of my Emmys at me, I knew there was no chance for reproachma between us. Mike, I'm proud of you. That was a big moment. Thanks. I'm that was a big moment. Fun. Appreciate it. And that's it for today's Big Word Alerts. You're welcome.
This is the Rich Eisen Show. David Aldridge of The Athletic here uh, on the Rich Eisen Show. Heard nationwide, televised online at richeisenshow.com. It's very difficult right now for me to be all about, you know, sports is important and we need to get back and open everything up. It's very difficult, you know, with everything that's going on in our country. Live from the Rich Eisen Show studio in Los Angeles, today's guests, Basketball Hall of Famer Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, plus Pro Football Hall of Famer Ed Reed. And now, it's Rich Eisen. We say hello to our friends at NBCSN, and I say hello to my friends across the aisle, and Chris Brockman and Mike Del Tufo. Good to see you, buddy. Good uh, to see you, Rich. We've already been on the air for an hour. Uh, YouTube.com slash Rich Eisen Show, Sirius XM Channel 211 is the ways you can stream us and watch us for all three hours. I came on the air um, and offered again uh, to chat throughout this uh, this program at 844-204-RICH being the number to dial. Um, and we were not on the air yesterday, and we, we, uh, we send our... Um, Thank you to our friends at NBC um, and our friends at NBCSN. Um, they are awesome and totally um, wonderful partners. No other way to put it. When you know we were talking about what was going on over the weekend, the whole country seeing what's going on outside the world, and um, we decided with what was going on in the city of Los Angeles uh, with civil unrest on the streets and certainly in parts of the city that um, rarely sees it. We decided to just stay at home yesterday and keep uh, keep everyone at home and see how uh, everything was going on in the streets before coming back and we're here. And NBC was just like totally understanding and saying, we'll take the, take the day off. We'll see you Tuesday if you can and we're here. And I'll, I'll just summarize again for our, this audience what I said at the very top of, of the program is that it's it's very rare for me, um, very, very rare for me to wonder um, what to say and what you as a fan out there taking us in want to hear about today. Do you want a total escape from the world? We, we're here to provide that. That's why we're here. I mean, shoot, we did, we did the last two months of a show in a pandemic, and then a burgeoning depression. In terms of civil unrest or what it feels like something even worse, a war on our streets. We're wondering, do you want to just tap out of that? Or is what's going on in the streets way too significant to not a, a big ignore? So we're going to talk about it today. There is some other matters to discuss in the world of sports major league baseball is making some news there's always something going on in the nfl we'll stroll down a little bit of memory lane for that because on nbcsn tonight at 8 eastern time is the re-air of uh, the first super bowl we ever covered on this show which was the one in arizona patriots and seahawks ed reed will join us on the program top of our final hour here uh my wife's known ed for a while before I met him working with NFL Network, we called him over the weekend. See how he's doing, just check in with him, tell him we love him. Because he is one of the, I mean, I love this guy. As a matter of fact, he said, uh, when he called back, he called me a a brother from another mother. I said I would tell my mother that. (laughs) And did you? No. Okay. (laughs) Not yet. I mean, she's out there watching, so. Hi, Mom. That's how he referred to me. He said, I'll tell my mom that. We want to just tell him we love him. And um, he's just like, how about I call him? We chop it up. He will call him. We will chop it up. He's the best. There's a lot of it going on. A lot to chop. And then Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is calling in in about 10 minutes time. 
And here's a man who was on the forefront of racial strife and civil unrest in the late 60s with Bill Russell and Muhammad Ali and Jim Brown at his side. Those are some famous photographs. Look at that one right there. Look at him and Bill Russell tower over Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali was like 6'2", right? Big so guy. So Kareem will join us. And by the way, Muhammad Ali up there, speaking of people associated with the city of Louisville, and uh, born and bred Louisville, Kentucky, University of Louisville's finest, Wes Unseld passing away today at the age of 74. So I'm sure Kareem will have something to say about Wes, who, you know, interestingly enough, just to, I guess, bring everything kind of together, um, Wes was the first black man, first African-American athlete to be offered an athletic scholarship by Adolph Rupp to the University of Kentucky. Rupp, I guess, was told to pound some sand, and he went to Louisville. And the NCAA All-American then went to the Baltimore Bullets in the 68 draft. He was also selected by the Kentucky Colonels of the ABA. And then Wes Unseld won a championship in the city of Washington, D.C. Beloved. He and his wife opened Unseld's school in 1979, a co-ed private school located in southwest Baltimore, daycare, nursery schools, kindergarten to eighth grade. So maybe LeBron was taking a page from Wes Unseld's book when he was creating his charter school in his hometown. Wes did it, however, in Baltimore. Anyway, we'll talk about all this with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. You know, and I will I will send you to our YouTube page for the full way that I opened the show. It was I, I it, it 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 felt a long time, probably about twenty minutes long, or about eleven minutes longer than a knee was on the neck of George Floyd when he was murdered on the streets of Minneapolis. About a week ago, that we can all be incensed about that as well as incensed about the rioting and looting on the street, as well as incensed about what appears to be the state of policing in this country, while also lionizing the good cops, those who do protect and serve in the manner in which they've been sworn to do so in the cities in which they've been sworn to do so. My Twitter feed also showing wonderful moments of policing in Camden, New Jersey, in Flint, Michigan. We can also be outraged by the looting in this country, outraged by it, while also supporting the importance and crucial nature of peaceable assembly. And that the Constitution does still stand for something, and it's still a written document that shouldn't be tortured and twisted for the benefits of political gain. And the crucial, crucial necessity to abhor violence and call it out when you see it. We can believe all that. There is a spot in that, in this crazy world of ours where we can believe in all of that and come together in some way, shape, or form, in some form of unity and teach everyone who is young and impressionable that we are one human race. We do not see color. We should not see color if you're thinking about it. We all bleed and love and want and need and desire. We all deserve the same rights under our Constitution that appears to be under attack on a daily basis. I'm scared, I'm not going to lie. 
I'm concerned. I'm frightened. I want to feel unified, United States of America. I want to feel that the way I'm asking people to feel and love as I did from this chair when my dad passed away in December. I never thought I would retweet my thoughts on the subject matter from December because it's still raw for me, my dad passing away in December. But I felt what I said then deserved to be repeated now, which is what my dad would want is people to love and connect and unify. And what he stood for, which was empathy and sympathy and understanding and respect for women and respect for all races are ideals and necessities that show strength, not weakness. To ask somebody, how can I help? What can I do? How are you feeling? As opposed to, I'm just going to run you over. As opposed to, I'm just going to hate and divide because it makes me feel better because I don't understand why people are being so upset and angry. To ask for thoughts and help and to deliver empathy and respect, those are strengths, not weaknesses. And I hope we can all come together. Normally, sports will do that. People root for the same touchdown, not knowing that they're on completely opposite ends of a political spectrum. People root for the same field goal, three-point shot, even though they might not share the same love in their heart for each other. So hopefully a show like this one can show the way. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's first up. Let's take a break. We will talk to the man who wrote a remarkable op-ed on this subject and has a lot to say. Basketball Hall of Famer Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Pro Football Hall of Famer Ed Reed, and you. By the way, my back's killing me, too. So what exactly yeah, well, happened? Well, yeah, Rich, please explain. You told me your back there, and I was like, wait, what? So yesterday when we were off, mm -hmm. and it appeared that everything in our city was somewhat calmer than the day before. The previous two days. Right? Yeah. And then we heard that a curfew was going to be put in place for our for the city of L.A. that where businesses were going to shut down at one and then everything off the streets by four. And, you know, I'm here every day. We know when I'm here every day. I decided, you know, I'll pitch in. I'll do I'll do whatever needs to be done to pitch in at home. So let me go shopping. Oh, let me glove up. Let me mask up. Let me go shopping. All right. And <laughs> had a moment. Had a moment in the in the uh, in, in the dairy section. Oh no! You reach reach for, for some, reach for a, a one percent. No one percent. Reach for a little one percent, which was right uh, around right around thigh level. Okay. And I went like that. Just. Snap. I you got felt this. It. What is Just that? Just gotta reach the check. Thank you. Very <laughs> I was doing the outkit. No, right, right, right. I. Well, <laughs> you got. <laughs> you oh my gosh. Yep. Yep. Almost it's clean up on aisle twelve, man. Almost went right down on the ground. You know how it works. Have you ever had back problems? You've had back uh, problems. I have oh not. my. I don't even want to say. I can't even say it out loud. I'm just gonna start knocking. Sarah does have. Sarah's got the bad back. Well, carrying she's me. Not, yeah, I mean, I get it. You yeah, see yeah. the size of no, not you. The, oh. see the size of, she had. It, oh, before Cage. I'm just saying carrying. I thought you were going to make a joke about carrying. Carrying me you in your relationship. relationship. I could right. make that, but also 
Cage is a... He's like 20 pounds. He's huge. Cage is a monster baby. He's, he's huge. And he's I say huge. that with the ultimate of, of love and respect. Hey, oh I take I take a monster it that child he's you have a there. big fat baby. He's very big. BFB? Yeah, he's a BFB. <laughs> so, yeah, man. Do we want to... I, I have a poll question idea if you want it. What do you got? Can you notice the difference between 1% and 2% milk? Should that be our poll? Oh, God, no. <laughs> Stay away from that. Uh, do you notice a percent? I, I think you can. I'm Have you a, ever taken the soda taste test? Have you ever done that? Oh, yeah, I did that. We did Remember that. those famous commercials oh, with like Coke the, and Pepsi? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can tell, there's a difference for sure. 100%. Between, there's a difference between Diet Coke and regular Coke. Yeah. I could tell vodka, too. All right, so uh, we'll, <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll, we'll come back. It's Kareem Abdul-Jabbar time here on the Rich Eisen Show. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar will be joining us in a few minutes' time. We just uh, received a text that he may be a few minutes late. So uh, in the meantime, um, we're here live on the Rich Eisen Show yeah. on NBCSN, YouTube.com slash Rich Eisen Show, Sirius XM. Um, let's go to some phone lines right here and take some people's phone calls. 844-204-RICH is the number to dial. Um, let's go to Sharon in Louisiana. You're here on the Rich Eisen Show. What's up, Sharon? Uh, yes, sir. I want to address the nation, if I may. I want to ask this question to the white uh, race and other races as well. What have black people done y'all so bad that y'all can't stand to look at us, that y'all can't stand to, to, to see us, but yet y'all trust us enough to come into your homes to clean your homes? Y'all entrust us with your children. We clean your children. We teach them love as if we would treat our own, and yet y'all don't trust us. And some of you all, y'all teach y'all children that we are wicked, we're evil, we all we want to do is just rob and kill, and that is not the, that is not the case at all. So I'm just asking a question. Can we all just work together and come together and help each other? Our kids are looking at this, and y'all are raising up another generation to be just like the people that is teaching them to do evil. One more thing I would like to address, and it's about our American flag, and it's nothing negative about it. Um, the, the problem that I have with the problem with the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of, a, of the United States of America, I quote, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Indivisible means unable to divide or separate. Liberty, the state of being free within society from oppressive restrictions and etc. Justice, the quality of being righteous, impartiality, fairness. Example of the justice is someone being set free from prison after DNA evidence proves they are innocent. So the nation and the world is looking at us. Can we just please come together? Let the protesters march peacefully without having to draw a line in the sand and say don't cross it because that is why these people are being angry because y'all not allow are not allowing them to protest peacefully and that's where you see these people are tearing down things they don't have a right to do it but they're voice voicing their frustration well so i hope allow those people to protest peacefully please Sharon, I hope that um, that this uh, phone call has been in any way, shape, or form helpful to you. And just uh, I, I appreciate your thoughts and your your passion. And obviously, you're obviously um, uh, n needing to uh, get that off your chest. And I'm glad that this show allowed it. Thank you. Yes, I appreciate it. Have a great day. You too. Bye bye. That's Sharon right there. Hey, we're 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 teaching our kids at home. And hopefully everybody is doing the same. <sighs> He's one of our favorites here. One of the all-time greats in the history of sports. And not only that, in terms of giving his thoughts, giving his heart, and giving to the community writ large when it needs a voice 
He is Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. How are you, sir? I'm doing okay. How are you? I'm doing better for talking to you, and I appreciate your time. I want to give you the floor. What is in your heart and mind this morning, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar? Well, you know, it's kind of like I'm, I'm caught between hope and history, you know. Uh, I hope that uh, <clears throat> our nation is going to make the changes it needs to make uh, to realize, you know, its place and, you know, what it means and how important it is that we uphold what the Founding Fathers actually talked about, you know, what uh, Mr. Jefferson wrote in the, in the Declaration, that all men are created equal. we we got to make that a reality. And I think uh, the events of the past uh, week or so have really shown to all of America how much that is not a fact. And uh, that we, ha- we have to fix that. We have to fix it. What are your thoughts, um, your emotions, when you're now in 2020 talking about what appears to be the very same issue you were talking about in the late 60s, Kareem? Same issue. Uh, I, I remember the very first time I became aware of it. I was 17 years old, and a, a young man named uh, James Powell was killed by a police officer named Thomas Gilligan, I, and Parliament erupted into a riot, uh, you know, and I, I could have got shot. I could, you know, it just being out on the street was was dangerous, and you know, it, it hasn't changed any. It's it's the same exact issue, the same exact issue. Well, um, Colin Kaepernick uh, tried very hard to demonstrate peacefully about this very issue, and what happened to him? <clears throat> he was ostracized. He lost his job. He was blackballed, um, and this is the, this is the issue he was trying to talk about, and. It, it seems that the powers that be did not like him bringing it up. So, what would you counsel today? What will you? What? What? what uh, I, I. I guess, in a way, that's bringing it to what you you wrote about in your op-ed, and I'd like to give you the floor on that subject, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Just that uh, pe- people have to listen. Uh, you know, um, the. The, the criminal justice system is tainted with racism from top to bottom. It discriminates, and it makes people suffer. And that that has to end. It, it, ha- it has to end. We have to find a way how to uh, make criminal cops accountable. You know, the good cops, the overwhelming majority of cops are good cops, and they suffer, too, when bad cops do what they do. So, you know, we, we need to find some means to hold uh, bad cops accountable and, and keep them from uh, destroying everything that they destroy. Families uh, are, are trust in the law. Uh, they, 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 they squander the good deeds of all the good cops. So, uh, you know, something needs to be done about that. Well, also, uh, your headline, make a friend with someone who doesn't look like you. What do you mean yeah, by that? that? That's, a, that's a great idea. And um, understand their humanity and Understand that uh, despite the, the difference uh, in looks, uh, they might like chess or collecting stamps or whatever it is that you like. So, uh, you know, find out what we have in common in our great nation. It's, uh, it's a wonderful place to do that. So um, what does it mean that that, that would be... <laughs> In 2020, uh, fresh advice, right? I mean, it's it's kind of uh, a simple thing to just su- suggest, but how 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 do we, I guess, come together in that regard, Kareem? Uh, we we come together every day. I mean, in our nation, and especially in the cities of our nation, you know, people of incredibly uh, varied backgrounds come together and work together and and continue to make this the greatest nation in the world that's that's what america is about and we we got to keep that happening we 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 can't let uh you know uh, we 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 can't let bias and discrimination uh, you know just make a mess of it you know we 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 can't do that what do you we think- have to find a way to cope what do you think Muhammad Ali would think of this moment, Kareem? Well, Muhammad Ali spoke out numerous times about 
police violence. Um, it wasn't a new issue for him. Um, you can go back and check his, his statement. You'll see that he actually uh, spoke out on these issues. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar here uh, on The Rich Eisen Show. Uh, what would you suggest uh, politicians do, people in power, people who could make change? Um, what, what would you yeah, suggest? People in power, I mean, they, they need to, to talk to the people. They need to talk to each other and figure out a way legislation, legislatively to, to put laws in, in effect that will enable people to eliminate bad cops. That's it. Just bad cops. Uh, be amazed how how much healing that 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 would promote if that was a possibility that they could for the things that they do. Is there any specific part of the Constitution you'd call people uh, to to take a look at, Kareem? I know you're you're somebody who knows that document very well. Uh, is there a particular spot that you would say, "Hey, uh, person in charge X, Y, Z"? Go check this out. Well, uh, <clears throat> the whole idea of uh, promoting voting and uh, making the vote available, making it possible to vote, I think is uh, part of what our democracy is about. And uh, too many, uh, especially in red states, uh, they're, they're trying to cut it back, claiming that there's voter fraud. There's no voter fraud. Voter fraud is, is, is not a problem in our country unless the Russians are, 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 are meddling in our, in our elections. So, uh, you know, we, we, we've got to, we have to make the, the idea of one man, one vote, and everybody equal under the law. We have to make those two things a reality. And I'm, I'm hoping that people can hear that. Well, I know you've written about the 15th Amendment in, per, in particular. Uh, what, what, did, what, did, what do you want to bring to the people um, who are listening right now, viewing right now, who may not be familiar with your your thoughts on the subject, Kareem? Well, just that, you know, just consider all the efforts to keep black people from voting, you know, in the, in the, in the reconstruction of the South. Uh, any black people who tried to vote were uh, dealt with with violence. That's a tradition. That's an American tradition. Um, you know, it, black people voting... Uh, in all elections without harassment is a very recent phenomenon. And uh, sometimes that phenomenon seems to fade into the wind, okay? So, you know, we, we, we got to make it possible for to participate in, in, our, in our democracy. That's a must. A few more minutes left here with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Basketball Hall of Famer. Are you feeling well? Because before all this craziness hit, uh, we're living in a pandemic right now. Um, you're over the age of 70. Um, not telling any tales out of school that you also had some uh, health history that could leave you vulnerable. What are, what is your, what are you doing in, in this era of COVID-19, Kareem? Uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm staying home. I've, uh, I'm involved in a new technology now where I'm able to... Uh, send messages to people. Uh, if you go to iconogram.com, you can uh, see what I'm doing. I, I send congratulations for weddings, birthdays, uh, Father's Day, any anything that you're celebrating, funerals. Uh, I, I couldn't speak at that, but uh, it enables me to stay close to my fans. And, uh, you know, if anybody wants me to send a message to someone they know and, and love, uh, I'm, I'm happy to do it. <laughs> You can go to iconogram.com. And um, that's just your your staying inside, staying safe. What would you say to what would you say to athletes today about speaking up, speaking out? And you, you know, because you you referenced Colin Kaepernick before. Um, what would you say to athletes right now about this very moment, Kareem? Um, be calm. Uh, speak the truth. And uh, like I, I said earlier, uh, we have to reach out to all of our fellow citizens and uh, make make friends with people who don't look like you. Uh, if we can do that, we're gonna we're gonna turn this around. Okay. And before I let you go, uh, Wes Unseld passed away today, Kareem. Um, yeah. What are your recollections about competing with him and meeting him and getting to know Wes Unseld, Kareem? Wes was a great guy. Uh, you know, he was like uh, a big um, 
roadblock on on, on the on the basketball court. He, he was only like six seven, six eight, but uh, he still couldn't get rebounds over him because he he just denied this is on the on the court. He was uh, he was awesome in that sense, and he was a great player and a, and a nice guy. And I'm, I'm gonna miss him, and uh, my my uh, thoughts go go out to his family. Kareem, I appreciate the time. Um, I know, obviously, um, you're being asked to appear in many, uh, many different shows, many, many different uh, programs to give your thoughts on, on the subject. And, you know, I've always appreciated you coming on. And next time, maybe we could talk a little bit more uh, sports with you as opposed to life in general. I appreciate the time. I sure hope that uh, sports will be happening soon. You know, I'm missing it just like you are. I bet you are. And the uh, Lakers looked like they were they were heading towards uh, another championship in the case right there Kareem. Looks like they were on the verge there but uh, you know you, you got to play the games yes you do and hopefully they'll be back playing very soon we appreciate the time Kareem thanks for the call no problem you got it be well. you got it that's Kareem Abdul-Jabbar basketball hall of famer right here on the Rich Eisen show figured you get an old school voice and name out here talking about what's going on in the world uh, let's go back to the phone lines here on the Rich Eisen Show. Let's go to Leon in Baltimore, Maryland. What's up, Leon? Hey, Rich. How's it going, man? I'm uh, I'm hanging in there, and I hope you are too. Hope you are and your family um, happy, healthy, and safe today. Where I'm hanging as much as I can hang, brother. Uh, first and foremost, uh, thank you for uh, for just supplying a voice uh, of the many. Um, me as myself as an African American male. Uh, I'll tell you one thing that my mother, my uh, recently late departed mother, she passed last uh, this, this this April first. Mm-hmm. She gave me two lines of when I was when I was four years old. My, one of my very first memories, she told me, when you were born, you had two strikes already against you. That's black, and that you're a male. And you're gonna have to work twice as hard to get there to achieve whatever it is that you want to be. So, um, it's true in those words. Uh, maybe things that have transpired this past week allows people to lit and see a different perspective um, and it provides a sense of healing and maybe it allows people to stop those things. Um, also, as a sergeant of Marines in the United States Marine Corps Reserve, I try to teach my Marines, you know, uh, equality, fairness, consistency, and these are things that, 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 everyone that, that needs to take those things and just apply them into their lives. And, uh, man, you had me tearing up this morning, <laughs> this afternoon, Rich. Uh, but once again, thank you for supplying the voice of the many and, uh, love the show. Thank you. Uh, been watching you for, for, uh, shoot, I'm 30. I remember seeing you on sports center when I was six years old. Oh so. <laughs> my God. Oh, <laughs> So uh, oh. thanks a lot, Rich. I, I really appreciate you, man, and, and, and the fellas. So thank you for just thank you, the voice of the many. And uh, best wishes to you and your family as well. Right back at thanks, you. Thanks, Leon. Leon in Baltimore, Maryland. As I shared in the commercial break, my back seized up yesterday. And to hear somebody say, yeah, I watched you when I was six. The QL's got a little tighter right there. <laughs> Heavily medicated and broadcasting. Rich Eisen. I was 15 when I watched you. Does it make oh, you feel any bit better? Oh, my God. Rich, I wasn't 15, so we're good. Thank you, Mike. You're was, a little bit older than me. I, I appreciate you I was actually saying older that. than you, Rich. <laughs> Let's go to Wyatt, Wisconsin. You're here on the Rich Eisen Show. What's up, Wyatt? How's it going, Rich? How are you, Wyatt? Good. Um, I have a question today about Kyler Murray. Okay, Wyatt. Um, So last year had an extraordinary year. He won Offensive Rookie of the Year. Yep. Um, How do you think he can top that season this year? Okay. Now, Wyatt, again, remind me, you 12, 13? How old are you, 11? I'm 14. 14, all right. So are you done with school? Are you done? Yep, I'm all done with school. Okay. (laughs) So you got a lot of time on your hands, and I appreciate you calling in. Here's the deal. Let me explain to you. Uh, Chris Brockman, what did I say yes, in my final, you know, here, back when there was sports, Wyatt? Um, December. This was December. No, I thought this was the end of the year. This, yeah, was, was it this is post-Super Bowl, right? The oh, week right after Bowl. the Super Bowl. Got it. Good old days. Okay, yeah, right. Yeah, right. So right after the Super Bowl, right, I did my four-down segment where yeah, every single Tuesday it. I would do, I would give you four points 
from the NFL world. It was February 4th. Thank you, sir. And I would give you the first three downs of legitimate sports takes. My fourth down, if my back wasn't killing me, I'd get up right now and walk the three feet over and grab the hot take plank. You can't even reach the hot take oh, you know plank. What I'll oh, no. Rich. Oh, don't, don't no, do it. It's no. not worth it. I'm all right. I mean, I mean, you got your old man's shoes on, I see. Oh, Look my God. Things. Stop it. Goodness gracious. All right. I'll do this here. Hold on. There we go. I'm moving around very shortly. So I've got this. Oh, God. That just actually flared up. I was going to so, say. So, anyway, yeah. okay. it's a piece of plywood that we've got a Rich Eisen show logoed um, uh, pull up on. It's my hot take plank. I grab this plank whenever I would do my fourth down to give the hottest take possible. And my, but there's still a germ of truth in it, okay? Fourth down. Thank you very much. That's what we would do. Well, that. The reason why I'm bringing all this up, Wyatt, by the way, just show you my commitment to my craft. I put my back on the line just trying to grab the prop to make my point. But I said in my fourth down that Kyla Murray, fresh off of winning Offensive Rookie of the Year, was going to finish top five, top three. Top three. In the MVP voting in 2020. That's how I think Kyler Murray is going to follow up. And that was before DeAndre Hopkins <laughs> before. came into their world. Like six weeks mm-hmm. before. That was before all of that. I think Kyler Murray is going to have a dynamite year, a dynamite 2020 campaign. And then you see his head coach – you know, drafting like he's James Bond in a Bulgari <laughs> ad uh, in his in his house. I think the I think there's nothing but upside for your Arizona Cardinals choice this year, Wyatt. Mm-hmm. What do you think oh, of that? Yeah. What do you think of that idea? I think that's one of the most factual things I've heard. <laughs> okay, very good. So, how, how about your summer project? You write a, a paper on Kyler Murray. Uh, you study Kyler Murray's uh, offensive scheme, and you send it to us, and we'll post it. Okay, I will do that. Thanks, Rich. Okay, and while you're at it, maybe write another paper about how right I am all the time, Wyatt. I will also do that, Rich. Thank you, Wyatt. Easy, Wyatt. That's your homework. That's your homework. Kyler Murray, your fourth betting favorite for MVP. Improving the youth of America one phone call at a time. Or one fourth down at a time, Rich. Now, if I could only get some Motrin. <laughs> I like that. Is kid. there he's any Motrin a few, in the house? He's, he's called a few times. times. We've yeah. gotten a lot of kids who like are him. like... But I think it's the first one who's done with school as opposed to just, you yes, know. Uh, Rich, yeah. by the way, I'm going to leave guy. As I got older, a leave works. Is that right? Oh. oh. Motrim, you don't want to. I wanna... mean. Don't say blue pill. <laughs> I mean, I know where he was going. No, no, I'm saying oh. I got some Canadian stuff that uh, it's got oh. a little more kick to it. Is that right? Well, it's called Labatz. Is that what it is? <laughs> oh, all right, we'll take That's a break. True. More of your Molson. phone calls. Um, NBCSN programming note. We'll hit a little bit on what's on tonight. And stroll down a little bit of memory lane. I know what Chris Brockman's going to watch tonight. Yeah, buddy. Ed Reed also still to come here on this edition of the Rich Eisen Show. Okay, let's go to Norris in Louisiana. Let's take Norris's phone call here. Line five, Mike Del Tufo. What's up, sir? Good evening, sir. I've been watching you for a long time. You're uh, old school sports reporter. That's me. I know. Yeah, yeah. I used to have I'm a lot more school. hair, Norris. You I'm sound- old school. I'm 67. You sound it. I, I, I totally agree with Shannon Sharp. This is really uh, the best idea that I have heard. When the, this incident happened, when it's time for the lawsuits, I think they should sue the police retirement fund instead of the city. That way, the police who are around this kind of atmosphere will stop the other police from doing bodily harm to anyone who they're going to do bodily harm to, they're going to stop me because, hey, man, you messing with my money when I retire and can no longer work, that's going to mess with my income. So they're going to stop me from doing it. Instead of suing the cities, sue the police retirement fund. So that's, that's the only way it's going to work. That's what Shannon said? Cause I, Shannon I'm... said that last week, and I couldn't believe it. He's the only person, because it never crossed my mind either. Well, I appreciate you bringing that. I, I, retirement fund, and I would like for you to spread this around the sports uh, arena and trip it down to the news media, CNN, and uh, at the last note, try to trick it down to Fox News. 
but well, nobody's going to bust this thought process. Uh, Norris, I just, you just said it on my show. That's as big a platform as I've got. So you just yeah. got it out there, and I appreciate that's the time. It, that's really it's going to pass. The only thing I see that's going to work. When mm-hmm. you hit them in their pocket when they retire, they're going to prevent the other office from doing that because it's going to hurt them. Well, I appreciate you calling in, Norris. Thank you. You be well. Your family happy, yeah, healthy, hurt, and safe. It hurt in the city, which had nothing to do with it. It hurt the officers who were doing it. Thank you for the call. Appreciate that right there. So I've now gotten uh, – I didn't. I hadn't heard Shannon say that. Yeah, neither. Um, I, I've now gotten somebody saying I was six when I started watching you and I was 46 when I started watching you. Either way, I feel very fortunate to have been around as long as I have been. Hopefully. 15, don't make me. I, I was 15. Uh, shut up. Rich. 844-204-RICH oh. is the number to dial. We'll take more of your phone calls when we come back here on the Rich Eisen Show. Don't go anywhere. NBCSN still beckons Ed Reed and more. Don't go anywhere. Everybody, 844-204-RICH, number to dial. We'll take more of your phone calls in a second right here on the Rich Eisen Show. Tonight on NBCSN, uh, a replay of the first Super Bowl we ever covered as um, as a show in, uh, in Arizona. That was a fun time. The great Christopher J. Long, who used to run the uh, DirecTV and Audience Network, Mr. Premium Television himself built a, old a an Old West <laughs> town in a <laughs> dirt else, parking lot that turned out to be mud because it rained like crazy oh. uh, across the street from, I guess, was it even called University of Phoenix Stadium at the time? I don't it know was what it was called. University of Phoenix okay. then. I think it's State Farm now. Okay, right, yeah. right, right. Right across the street from that Jiffy Pop Dome that the Arizona Cardinals call home. Beautiful spot. Home of national championship games and everything. Dan Patrick's show had a um, had a hotel, or he had the bar, and we had the hotel. But anyway, we we were there, and it was the first Super Bowl we ever covered. New England at Seattle, and Alan Chris called it uh, with uh, Michelle Tafoya. The whole NBC crew was there, and NBCSN is going to re-air that game tonight at eight Eastern time. And I just remember the whole backdrop, obviously the conversation that lingers and will linger forever in the history of the NFL is why in the hell did Marshawn Lynch not get the ball again? Was that Dante Hightower clipped him Dante on his head? Dante Hightower. One of the greatest tackles uh, man. at the time Unbelievable because play. it set up apparently a run-pass option for this uh, this decision. Do we run or do we pass? I remember everyone wondering why Bill Belichick didn't call a timeout because right. if they scored, the Pats would have had about a minute left to get the ball back. Right, and the question would have been like, what's Bill doing? Right. And he just let the clock run and run and run, and then we all know Malcolm Butler came to the fore, and yeah. I proper to say no one had ever heard. Have you ever, did you even, had you even heard of him? Never knew. He was the sixth guy. He was the sixth defensive back. He wasn't even on the field. He ran onto the field and then made the play. And then we later saw they had practiced something very similar uh, the week before leading up to the game. And I had never in my life, because I was, it was the first Super Bowl in which I did not do the post game for NFL Network. I did the pre, I did the pre and the post the year before in New York City when the Seahawks destroyed Destroyed. Denver. Destroyed. And I just remember that we we got there at the stadium at like five in the morning, and I did the post game show and. In the third quarter of that game, that was already a blowout. Half of my analysts were taking a nap <laughs> right. because we were up at like four in the morning. And and I remember saying, you know, maybe we should have a split crew from now on. You know, <laughs> like the morning people do the morning and the night do the night and whatever. So I was sitting in the stands with Susie and the kids who we brought our <laughs> – we're like six and three at the time. God bless it. At any rate, the reason why I bring this up, I'm sitting in the stands, and I'd never before seen 
and haven't seen since a group of fans who went from celebrating to crying and vice versa in the snap of a finger. I have never seen what I saw that night, Seahawk fans delighting in the fact that they were about to have survived a fourth quarter onslaught from TB12 himself. Look, Can you look up his fourth quarter stats in that game? Or yes. you just know it off the hold top on. of your head as a Patriot fan? No, no, hold on. Uh, Ed Reed's guy is calling me. Hold on a second. Okay, fine. It was that ending was unbelievable. It went. I was there. Brady had a Crazy. remarkable fourth yeah, quarter yeah, at was, the time. Okay, so they were celebrating an absolute delight. Insane, yeah. right? We went. We from got this him. Whole we got him. We got him. Correct. Yep. So, and then went from that to absolutely. Oh, it was like crying. And Patriot fans, God bless them, who were beyond distraught. As if they had never won a Super Bowl. True. Okay. As if they had never won the big one. Could not believe at all that they were losing it. What had just happened. And then they celebrated like they'd never won a Super Bowl before. Yeah, there were. I had Seahawks fans right in front of me, Patriot fans next to me. To see that swing. Right. In those seconds, it was the only The only moment I could even compare to that was being at the 2001 World Series where Yankee fans were celebrating because Mariano Rivera just set down the Diamondbacks in order in the eighth, and here comes the ninth in game seven, and Rivera coming out for his typical two-inning save. Yep. Watching the, the wives of the Diamondback players crying. I remember seeing Matt Williams' wife who I believe was the actress from Blame It on Rio fame. Her name escapes me right now. She was crying with a bunch of other Diamondbacks fans. And then it reversed. But that took place over like a 10-minute span. I've never seen a snap of a finger. No, like that was that. A, it was insane. And the thing that's really remarkable, just to bring this all full circle, it's being re-aired tonight, is... It totally obliterated the conversation that took place the entire week leading up to it, which was Deflategate. It obliterated. Yeah. And going into that game, we all thought the entire game was going to be played under the pall of what was going on with the footballs. And even if, even if, even if the footballs, we as fans, knew weren't messed with or they were removing it from the concept of scandal that that would still be the conversation after the game not even close (laughs) just to bring full circle of just a reminder how much that was on the minds of everybody the first guest our show ever had at a super bowl ever our first in the in the six super bowls that we've covered and we look forward to many more the first guest the Rich Eisen show ever had at a Super Bowl was none other than Marissa Tomei. I mean, because Bill Belichick, in his final press conference, trying to put Deflategate all to bed leading up to the Super Bowl. Do you have it, Mike? Yeah, I got it. Go for it. I'm not a scientist. I'm not an expert in footballs. I'm not an expert in football measurements. I'm just telling you what I know would not say that I'm Mona Lisa Vito of the football world as she was in the car expertise area. <laughs> I mean, I mean, Bill. I mean, Bill. So we immediately yeah, okay. got on the stick and just like every, uh, just like every now and then, uh, mostly every single time we get a, a, a guest that's kind of the A-lister from a world that's not of our own. Right. Although pop culture is our world. Susie's the one who's like, I-, I got this. And Marissa Tomei wound up calling in yeah. as our first guest. First guest, first Super Bowl. Yeah, I know, first Super Bowl. Like, we've been on the air for like three months. <laughs> like, this is amazing. I still can't believe that happened. Right. All of it. I still can't believe that game happened. Like that crazy catch on the sideline is like, Ty- that Tyree. was uh, 
a curse, right? Was that the the name of the receiver? Was a kid? He, he, yeah, the it kid was that, a kid who didn't who then do... got got traded to the Jets. It was like Tyree 2.0, oh, you know, you think and he you gets thought knocked it was down done and over. It falls in his lap, and then you're like, oh, man, they're just going to give it the Lynch three times, game right. over. So you took a call from Ed Reed's guy. He's going to re- reschedule for tomorrow then. Yeah, something came okay. up uh, with Ed down in Florida, so he's going to call him tomorrow. Yeah, and I, I remember Ed's Super Bowl in New Orleans. That was unbelievable. And just, I guess, to bring it all completely full circle in this hour – and the second hour, we'll talk a little bit more sports, and the phone lines will be all for you. We're cleared because Edwards our only guest, and he's going to be on tomorrow's show now. Yes. Okay. Um, eight four four two zero four. Rich number to dial. Ed Reed Super Bowl in New Orleans, his hometown. He got to ride off into the sunset in his own town. But he then decided to go to the Jets. But that's okay. <laughs> I'm not just saying that because Ed decided to. Uh, postponed till tomorrow. It's the truth. He decided he just couldn't quit football, so he played yeah, for the right. Jets, which brought up, I guess, to bring this more the other direction. But my favorite moment for the NFL 100 all time team show this year was Ed sitting next to Deion Sanders, me, Chris Collinsworth, Bill Belichick, Deion, and Ed. Oof. And Deion saying, to Ed, hey, tell everybody about you going to the Jets that one year and about what you saw and what that, you know, meant for you. Knowing this the story, and he would bring up the story. And Ed told the story about how he went there and it took him all of just a couple of weeks to realize he was brought in to coach the players as much as play. And the players were in total the Jets were in total disarray. I think this was at the the end of the Rex Ryan era. I think. And they were in total disarray. Players weren't listening. They weren't doing this. They weren't doing that. He had to come in and try and set the record straight with them, try and be a leader. It wasn't working. And he kind of wished that he had stayed a Raven for his entire career. Ed tells this story. And I decided to throw it a break by saying, well, Ed telling the story about the disarray of the New York Jets and knowing his, your true affinity for Ed Reed, Bill Belichick, this might be your favorite segment in the history of the NFL 100 <laughs> all-time team show. Did Bill laugh? I, it's one of those things as a host where you're kind of like, please tell me he's laughing. Is he laughing? He's laughing? <laughs> he gave a chuckle. For some reason, that I think that got left on the NFL oh. film's cutting room floor. I don't think that made the final cut. It's kind of a bummer about that. And also played for Houston for a few games that year, too. Did he really? Yeah. Because the, the, the Jets released him, right? I think he wanted just out of there. Yeah, he played five games. But anyway, uh, Ed's Super Bowl, that was the Super Bowl with the blackout in the middle of the game in New Orleans. That was bananas, man. And the 49ers, as you all know, had four shots from inside the red zone to win that game. And in the same way that we relive the Ohio State-Miami pass interference call that shouldn't have been called, that game used, was just recently shown in the same way that NBC's showing all these Super Bowls. I forget which entity showed it. And I know it was out there because Dan Fouts was trending, which frightened me. Anytime you see a name like that trending, you're right. like, what is this for? Oh, okay, people are complaining about him being biased on behalf of Miami. Oh, my gosh. He and Keith Jackson with that call. Four shots. And I think 49er fans will tell you that Michael Crabtree was held at one point in the end zone. They should have had a fresh set of downs. No call. The play calling was also a little Go bit. figure that. So, uh, some, some, uh, some referee controversy being talked about in a big game in the Superdome. Where have we heard that one in recent days? I know. You know the quarterback who could have won that Super Bowl and was on the verge of winning the Super Bowl? After a monster comeback that Ray Lewis said was brought on by somebody pulling the plug on <laughs> the generator in New Orleans, like at the end of uh, Airplane, Colin Kaepernick. Colin Kaepernick almost won a Super Bowl, people. I'm telling you what, man. 
I, I know it would be you could be accused of PR this, PR that. Could you imagine if an NFL team steps forward and says Colin Kaepernick is now on our team right now? Can you imagine if an NFL team right now got together with Colin Kaepernick and he felt like this was a real opportunity? What if the Baltimore Ravens decided, I understand RG3, you're, you're our backup. What if Colin Kaepernick was brought in in Baltimore? Would the city truly revolt? Would they really revolt right now with everything that's going on in the world? I'm just throwing them out there because if he's not going to be a starter and he's going to be a backup, what better spot would it be than with Lamar Jackson? Would they lose? In, how much would they? And I know I'm saying this at the expense of RG3 with all due respect. Now would kind of be a great time. I think. It's been a great time for three straight years. Yeah, I know that. 844-204-RICH is the number to dial. Okay, our first hour on NBCSN is in the books. Our final hour is for you. Our phone lines are all lit. We'll also talk about what's going on in the world of Major League Baseball. Are they finally coming around and trying to put together a 2020 playing season? Because we could all love it and use it. Podcast1.com slash Rich Eisen is how you can get our podcast every single day, all three hours. We'll be right back with your phone calls at 844-204-RICH. Number to dial here on this Tuesday edition of the Rich Eisen Show on Sirius XM, Channel 211, YouTube.com slash Rich Eisen Show, and NBCSN. Have to you know, well, hold on. He's just going no. for it. He just went for it. Now, Dan. Wow. What? Dan, that's a violation. So why are you not carrying forward the whole Western thing? I don't know how I collect on that reward back there. If you do collect that reward money, I hope it's the alive part. Why are you dressed like Alex P. Keaton? Well, <laughs> I'm trying to get you on a horse before we I know you are. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, Rich. Oh, Rich is on the horse. Oh, oh Rich. yeah. Here we go. Yeehaw. Is this going on the Emmy reel? AJ Green <laughs> using the new glove technology. <laughs> Oven mitts. All right, he's got that. Brockman trying to uh, dot the eye and look out. Yeah. Oh my goodness gracious. <laughs> AJ Green going along with number one fingers. <laughs> oh yes! Everybody's trying to get a Seahawk this week to have a one-on-one -on -one interview and I've got the exclusive. Are you here because you just don't want to get fined? Here is the connection. Yes, Bob. Between me and JB Smooth. It involves the cult classic yeah. Pooty Tang. <laughs> it goes without saying, without me, Pooty Tang is nothing. I'm back there hearing trash talking to me, man. I mean, I wasn't trash talking I you. I up to you, man. I was talking you up. Not I'm going to sign your pity on a runny kind. <laughs> and if we, you want to uh, if you want to try to stop me, I got to say the name of Sam Newton is here. Who do you think is going to win? Respectfully, I could care less. <laughs> Honestly. Uh, yeah. You could see a snoop howdy part. I'm doing real good today. I got my Cowboy hat on, I'm feeling good. It's kind of similar. I give you, like, a who's going to win the best TV show award. Well, it's the Rich Eisen show is the best one, Cam. Of course. Three buffalo gals going around the outside. Who's <laughs> 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 we working? Oh! Yes! 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 Oh, yes, let it out!
This is the Rich Eisen Show. David Aldridge of The Athletic here uh, on the Rich Eisen Show. Heard nationwide, televised online at richeisenshow.com. It's very difficult right now for me to be all about, you know, sports is important and right. we need to get back and open everything up. It's very difficult, you know, with everything that's going on in our country. Live from the Rich Eisen Show studio in Los Angeles. Earlier on the show, Basketball Hall of Famer Kareem Abdul Jabbar. Coming up, Pro Football Hall of Famer Ed Reed. And now, it's Rich Eisen. Well, everybody, it's our final hour here on this uh, Tuesday in Los Angeles, California. Ed Reed is going to be joining us tomorrow. Something has come up, um, and it must be something significant if he says he's got to push till tomorrow. So we will chat with the Pro Football Hall of Famer then. Uh, we had Basketball Hall of Famer Kareem Abdul-Jabbar on uh, last hour. If you missed any of it, go to our our YouTube stream, youtube.com slash Rich Eisen Show, uh, is the way for you to, to check out our archives every single day. Uh, we're on from 1 to 3 Eastern every day right here on NBCSN. Chris Brockman and Mike Del Tufo are in their usual posts. Hey, bud. Good we to see had, you, man. We uh, had Dr. Todd Boyd uh, of uh, UFC uh, Film School. He's also a professor of race and pop culture. Um, and we decided to... Um, Put him right in the middle of our of our uh, cross section right here on the show. If you missed any of those conversations, please go hit that. Uh, we're keeping our eye on what's going on uh, in the real world best we can and going down this sports wormhole with you. Speaking of wormhole, um, the reason why we use that phrase a lot, and certainly that's the nickname that our uh, our fans on our YouTube stream wanted to call the chat room when we started streaming. Uh, day after the combine this year, uh, what do you want to call uh, the spot where you're all hanging out? They said the wormhole. That's because I go down a wormhole every single time the owner of the Knicks gets mentioned, James Dolan, uh, because uh, I can think of no worse owner in professional sports than this man. Uh, has totally destroyed my love of the Knicks. Totally. That the last dance did very try, uh, try to spark many times. It came back. Man, I wanted the I wanted Char, I still want Charles Smith to make a layup against the Bulls. I still do. He's still trying. He's he's, he's still trying. <laughs> I think he's still out yeah, there. Yeah. Honestly, just bringing up all that stuff, <laughs> right? Yeah. I know NBA TV re-aired Game Five of the the NBA Championship that the Knicks played that Game Five the day that OJ won on the low speed yeah. chase here in Southern California. They won that Game Five. They were one game away from the promised land. I. My love of the Knicks gets sparked just by seeing that stuff, and then I hear James Dolan's name, and I just – it's its destroyed. There are two NBA teams that have not made a public statement on what's going on in our world these days. Uh, the San Antonio Spurs and the New York Knicks. Now, Spurs coach Greg Popovich called, I think, what, the nation? He called Dave Zirin of the nation? Yeah. Oh, he just he gave both barrels. Sure did. Um, so I guess you could even check the box of the Spurs because Pop did, and what we put on the screen right here is that uh, this is the the tame. I, I shouldn't even say tame. This is the, the the only comments that we're putting up. I guess where he didn't just absolutely uh, eviscerate the president of the United States. So um, Pop has said that. So you 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 say at least. Uh, a face, a leading voice, if not the lead voice of the entire Spurs organization, is commenting on what's going on in the world. Knicks have yet to do it. Knicks haven't said a word. Right there in the city of New York, nothing. Zero point zero. And they are not going to make a statement. The franchise owner told employees the decision makes the Knicks an exception in a league where players and coaches have called for change on social media and joined protests. Zero. I'm going to sit this one out. No need to make a statement at all. I understand you don't want to offend law enforcement. Law enforcement is is a crucial part of our world. I understand that if you say that uh, George Floyd was murdered, which he was, that you can offend people in law enforcement. I guess those are the people who believe that law enforcement should be able to put their knee on the back of somebody's neck and kill him on a street. So if you're offended by me saying that George Floyd was murdered, then I kind of don't care what you think. Simple, right? 
can do that. Not uh, not James Dolan. Well, uh, I mean, he sent out an email to um, his employees, and it's it's a lot of word salad. It's a ton of word salad. What we say to each other matters. How we treat each other matters, and that's what will get us through this difficult time. Okay. Spoken like a guy who's going to let Charles Oakley rot in jail overnight. Let his guys go drag him out of Madison Square Garden and let him sit in jail for overnight. Spoken exactly like that guy. Apparently, according to Pablo Torre of of, um, ESPN, that uh, Madison Square Garden employees are currently meeting right now Kind of like a players-only meeting, except it's, as he points out, no players. Employees only. Talk about what are you going to do? Are you going to walk out on this guy? In the middle of a pandemic? Typical. Knicks are a total mess, leading nothing. Leading nothing in the community. Leading nothing in the standings. And I understand, again, Madison Square Garden was a spot where, you know, people can come together and that they were, I shouldn't say leading nothing in the community, is what I'm saying. But ter- certainly when we need it the most, wonder what the players think right there. Just an absolute abdication. This is where leaders need to lead. And I know he's buddies with, you know, the president, but you can call out the murder of George Floyd. Even Trump's doing that. I went down a wormhole, didn't I? Justified. Let's take some phone calls here. Robert in Middletown, Ohio. You're here on the Rich Eisen Show. What's up, Robert? Hey, Rich. How are you doing today, my Uh, man? I am. uh, I'm hanging in there. Uh, World seems to be spinning off its axis a little bit. I can't wait for the return of sports. Um, uh, I'm hopped up on Motrin because my back gave way yesterday. <laughs> I don't know how much more you want me to share. That's good enough for me. Okay. What's going on? Want, What's going on in your world? Share, I want to shed some light on, you know, I was in law enforcement for about 30 years. Yes, sir. And um, as law enforcement, I'm not going to speak like it's the uh, easiest job to have. But for a young black man in law enforcement, it's twice as hard. It's even harder to see what goes on behind the lines as a black man. I worked in corrections also. And it's even harder for, you think it's bad out here seeing a man with his knee on the neck of someone that has cameras. What about in the prisons where you don't have cameras? You have to think about that too. It's really bad. It's worse than you think. And this has been going on for years and years and years. I remember as a younger man in law enforcement, I walked in my house with a badge on, and my mother told me to get out because she did not like police. Mm. What should we do then, Robert? I mean, you want to suggest what uh, those out there who are watching this show, either uh, attempting to escape as much as they possibly can, but also wanting to keep their ear to the ground a little bit, or want to be more activist? What do you... What I do you think suggest? That what we have to do is it starts, leadership starts at the top. And you can't have people just sit on their hands and think that it's going to be all right for things to go on like they do. This is not just a black problem. I know a lot of people say, well, we as black people, but this is a problem that white people have to address. Uh, orange people, yellow people, whatever p- color people you want to look at and we all have to address and we have to stand up you know a lot of people sacrificed their lives for us years and years and years rosa parks all these people made sacrifices for us and not one time do we want to make sacrifices for the people that has to live behind us our future i know there's a big coronavirus financial problems in the United States, but all this is happening for a reason. I know they talk about the chicken coming home to roost and different things like that, but karma is true. If we don't stand up for something, 
you won't stand up for anything. And sometimes we have to be the the dog instead of the tail. Mm. And we have to wag the tail instead of dog wagging the tail. Robert, you understand? I do, yes. and I appreciate the time. Thank you for saying what you said and and, and sharing. All right, you're welcome. Appreciate have a good it. One. You same. That's Robert Midtown, Ohio. I will just add this. Let's make sure if you're being what the dog is that what he said and not the tail or something to use it to be um peaceful the violence is what the other side and i can't believe there's another side but there definitely appears to be and i'm not talking about what you be what people believe to be police being the other side i'm talking about some bad actors out there that are trying to co-opt the rightful cause and the rightful ability to peaceably assemble and to castigate people who are peaceably uh, assembling peaceably as the bad actors. If you're being violent, you're only feeding what people who are hoping to use as a further way to divide, you're only feeding them with a weapon. Back to the phone lines here on the Rich Eyes Show. Hold on, let me go get my glasses on. Um, Mark in Minnesota, what's going on, Mark? So um, I wanted to talk about baseball and go for what it. you think it would take back for them to come back. Go for it. What do you want to talk about? Just that you think they're going to come – just wondering if they're going to come back at all? Yeah, because they have their uh, new proposal out, and it doesn't seem like many people are in favor of it inside the company. Well, I got to tell you, man, I, I hope it. I hope they, they do because I'll just repeat again here, Mark, and thank you for the call. Um, you know, uh, they, they can't just throw their hands up, and it appears that baseball's putting it out there, uh, as Jeff Passan, our friend at ESPN, is reporting – that uh, barring an agreement, the league is just going to implement a 50-some-odd game, a fifty some odd game season, and they're going to say, hey, players, you want to be prorated. How about just on 50 games, that'll be about, what is that, Chris, 30% of your salary? Right? Is that what they said? 50 games is uh, 30%, yes. Yes, so 30% of your salary. And uh, the one, players want their right, their right, hundred fourteen right. game proposal. Hundred fourteen game would pay them seventy percent. Yes. So either come down off your seventy percent, or we'll just unilaterally go in there and say fifty percent. Uh, 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 thirty. You get fifty games, thirty <laughs> percent. That's what appears to be out right yeah, now. But I, I'll pa- part of me makes me, and again, I don't know how that sits with players. To me, 30% is better than no percent, and 50 games is okay. So that's better than 100 and some odd. Let's get this game. Let's get the games in. 50 games, to me, would be enough to determine who could be good or not. I mean, that's not a lot yeah, of games. Yeah, people were saying last year the Nationals were 19 and 31 after 50 games. Well, didn't the Cardinals go on quite a run? I mean, so, we could say again, know. right? The St. Right. Louis Blues and hockey yeah. were were Cinderella's in the yeah. back half of a season that they didn't stop losing totally. until they hoisted the cup. Totally. So we've seen that before. But we got to get a season in. We need something. It, if there's no baseball season this year, they're not going to be able to recover. I think that that is accurate. It would be it would be certainly if other leagues are going to come back. It's a bad look when NBA and NHL comes back, soccer's coming back and these guys can't figure it out. Are you hearing ESPN reporting that the NBA small market teams want all 30 teams to show up in Disney World? They want all 30 teams to do what like you can't Why? you can't you can't take teams that are already eliminated from the playoffs because they stunk on ice like all due respect the Cavs and the Warriors exactly. are what's both the point of sending the Cavs down there? eliminated how are you going to take teams that have already been eliminated and say you've got to come and play out the string unless you say unique circumstances have changed and we need all 30 teams to come 
and you're all in from 15 to 8, 8 down to 15, you're all in a tournament to play for who plays the 8, who's in the 8 seed, right? And and everybody else kind of gets up to speed in a way. Again, hockey, the way hockey's doing it is the top seeds all play each other in a round robin to see who is seeded first. And then everybody else that's coming back, the 24, the 31 teams, all play in a play-in sort of NCAA tournament type manner and that's the way everybody gets back into shape, back into ice shape, back right, into right. playoff hockey shape best you can. So however you can get the one through seven teams to be back into shape and eight through 15, in the same way that Brian Winhorst of ESPN suggested that the NBA changed the re- end of their regular season to do, where you got teams eight through 15 play each other in an NCAA tournament type manner for the right to be the eighth seed and go for it. That's the only way you could say all 30 teams have got to come back. Right. But it's a one-shot deal. It's, 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 one, it's a one game. I would proffer to say, however, if you're, a small, cool. if you're a small market team sitting at the top of your standings or a small or mid-market team sitting at the top of your standings, let's just say Milwaukee leaps to mind, right? Best team in the NBA. Correct. Let's just say you say that and you want all 30 teams in there. What if the Warriors say, okay, you know what? You're making me come back. Steve Kerr is already like, you, you're, 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 you want me to rev up the engines? You want me to turn the machines back on to use the trading places phrase? Yeah. All right. Hey, Clay, how's your knee doing? <laughs> oh, it's good? All right. Hey, Steph, how are you feeling? Steph, how's that hand of yours? You're back to yeah. 100%? Oh, that's great. Draymond, you're pissed at the world, right? Okay. Hey, Andrew Wiggins, how you doing? Oh, all right. Where what? Where the 15th seed? Oh, okay. <laughs> you want a piece of that? You I, want a piece of that? Not really. I will tell you what you don't want a piece of not is really, that. No. Greatest 15 seed since what? Uh, Middle Tennessee State? Uh, Richmond Spiders. Richmond Spiders. They, but they didn't advance very far. That's true. They survived and advanced maybe one spot. I, I, if, if I'm the NBA and I want to win a chi- title this year, and because at some point you will turn from can we do it, how much is it going to cost to do it, what are the protocols to do it, eventually you will hopefully – like all of us as sports fans, get into that bubble world where all you care about is the competition. And once you care about the competition, then you're going to turn your eyes to who are you competing with and the Golden State Warriors show up. But is it for ratings? Like, if, do we need the well, Warriors? What if, and what if the Warriors, you could tell the Warriors, you've got to come, but guess what? The way that the seedings are now, you still are in that spot for the ping pong balls for the next draft what if that's the way you say to the Cavs come on in it doesn't matter how far you advance you still have the fallback position of of being whatever the math is right, you're, having the yeah, 20% yeah, or whatever the, yeah they change the math once the Knicks finally get their ping pong balls in that spot you, you, you see what I'm saying yeah that, that might be a way that you can convince those guys because I don't blame Damian Lillard for a second when he's like I'm not coming out of my house and out of quarantine and dragging my family across the country or leaving them in Oregon to just play out the string. Now, you want to give me a shot to wave bye-bye at somebody in a best of five? I've done that. I've been there. I'll do that. I'm dying to know. But I saw that. I saw that. Bottom line on ESPN that the small market teams want 30 teams to show up when they restart. All 30 teams. Even the NH, even the NHL told like the Devils and other franchises, you see just you. take the rest You're of done. the year off. Yeah. See you next year. We'll see. 844 rich number to dial. We'll take your phone calls right here on the Rich Eisen Show here on this Tuesday.
Mike Del Tufo over there, when Justin Hartley of This Is Us was here on Friday, he planks weights on his back. Okay, there he is, putting plank after plank. Those are 45 pounds. He waves on more weight. See, come on, let's get some more. <laughs> right? Del Tufo sees this and he goes, oh, I could I could do that, is what he said. And Why, he said, and, no, he said, he, said he, would do, he said he would do 145. 145. Now, we took that, when you say when he can do 145, how much weight do you think that means? Just off 145. Of right. No. <laughs> no. One plate that weighs 45 pounds. Oh, 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 get out of here. One plate that's 45 pounds. How long do you say you can do this? A minute. Come on. All right, here we go. Mike, get off your knees. 45 pounds. Come now. Go. The right spot in your mind, buddy. Come on. Look at him. All we see is the finish line, baby. All we see is the Coach him up, Herb. Coach him up. See. Victory is simple, baby. Ooh. Right uh -oh. now, uh -oh. don't worry uh -oh. about the okay. body, baby. Our mind's controlling our body. Our Preach, body Michael. Preach. Control our mind. We got this, baby. We got this. We gonna show the world. That's what you're about. What do we got? Show the world, baby. Don't worry about uh -oh. it. Just stay there 24 seconds. Flat now. Flat now. Don't worry about it. Worry about it. Right? We got two blocks out. All right. We got two blocks gone. Halfway home. We got two blocks gone. You Halfway got two home. more to go. All see, just see that finish line. Look at the glory. Look at your chest <laughs> touching the tape. Get your chest on that tape. Look at you, baby. 20 you're seconds to go. In. You're coming in 20 seconds, baby. You can finish this, man. We can do this. I do that every day, people, at the gym. I can't tell. I do it. I do it. Podcast1.com slash Rich Eisen Show to catch all three hours of our program here. Um, and uh, anytime you want, give us a listen. Put us in your ear gate, to use the phrase of my my buddy Michael Irvin. Um, let's go back to the phone lines here. 844-204-RICH is the number to dial. Who's been waiting the longest? Um, let's go to um, our friend Jake in California. What's up, Jake? Hey, Rich. How you doing? What's First, going on? Um, caller. Just had some questions to think about the Raiders this year, man. Picked up some good defensive moves. Wanted to think if they were like a top 15 defense, then they can make a run for it. Well, uh, thanks for the call. Appreciate that. Speaking of making a run right. for it, did you hear Henry Ruggs um, hurt his thigh helping a friend move? Did you hear about that? I did see that. Yeah, I did see that. And that sound you hear right now is Gruden basically saying it's called a professional mover, man. <laughs> Tell you what, man. Tell you what, man. Call up some movers, man. The only thing I want you doing is taking those little pieces of popcorn confetti and just the popcorn styrofoam and put them in a box and tape it up, man. Oh, gosh. Great question by Don. What? What's the worst thing a friend could ask you to do? Pick them up from the airport or help them move? Oh, move. Oh, move. That's not even a question. Come on. It takes two seconds. Least, okay, let me just make the case for helping someone move. 
they do provide you maybe with some lunch or some beverages while you're helping them move. Driving to the airport is one of the worst things. No, no, I love the airport. I love driving in the airport. I would argue if a friend asks you to pick them up from the airport, they're not your friend. Wow. Because you could just say take a car, right? Get a cab. cab, Hop in a cab. I'll pay for it. Car service. I mean, I'll... We'll give you a few bucks for that if you really need me. I mean, the co- inconvenience of going to the airport, especially LA, I, I don't is mind terrible. It all. Rich, uh, Rich Eisen <laughs> show Grand Master TJ Jefferson is TJ. <laughs> this 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 got TJ <laughs> Jefferson <laughs> chiming in today. I, I mean, the, the funny thing is, Brockman lives eight minutes from the airport, so it's really not that much of an well, hold inconvenience. Hold on a second. I, it's I like used you to live right there. No, I used to live in deep Hollywood, and it was the worst to get to and from the airport. Well, here's the thing. <laughs> If you want to talk about New York City. There you go. Manhattan, oh, no, 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 no. Manhattan to JFK. If you're talking about... Now, you remember the the uh, the Seinfeld episode about the Van Wick? Oh, the Van oh, Wick. And that the Van Wick was undefeated was the phrase. I think was it George or Jerry used oh, that phrase? Jerry said that, yeah. That the Van Wick was undefeated. I just the shook. most time-insensitive roadway in the United States. And I know every single person out there who's listening to us can tell me about how traffic is terrible in that town when they there's no pandemic the and there's no, you know, social unrest. Five o'clock on the van. Oh, my God. Okay. So put it all together and you got yourself the worst roadway in the history of United States traffic into Van Wick. Okay. So there's that. You can't ask somebody to move, you know, I would perhaps rather help somebody move and take them. Than, than pick you up and have to go through the Van Wick. But other than that, though, you know, you're helping, you're getting someone from the airport, you're welcoming them to your town. You're, you know, if it's a family member, you could start the process of, connecting certainly if you only have two days i just mean if it's a friend if like mike was like hey i'm uh, i'm coming back from chicago can you just pick me up at the airport no clarification is is everything boxed that makes a big deal is everything boxed well it sounds like again with henry ruggs yeah you're not packing it sounds like henry ruggs was uh didn't matter if it was boxed or not apparently apparently it wasn't like it punctured his thigh or something yeah (laughs) sounds like he's fine but yeah yeah but just, but you know. if, if you're the Raiders, it's just like, hey, Henry. Hey, Henry, come on. 16 and 0, man. Uh, I know, right? <laughs> Make a phone call. Puts it in jeopardy, man. That's for sure. Let's go to Tim in Louisville, Kentucky, here on the Rich Eisen Show. What's up, Tim? Hey, uh, just wanted to uh, make a few comments about Wes Unseld. Sure. Sure. Uh, so he and I were both born in 1946, uh, went to different high schools. Uh, when he was a sophomore, um, he went to Seneca High School, and I went to St. Xavier. Uh, our two high schools played some epic basketball games, and he was a center for Seneca, and the center for uh, St. X was a fellow named Mike Silliman, who ended up playing at West Point for Bobby Knight. Um, and they both, well, uh, Mike Silliman did five years uh, serving our country uh, after he graduated, but then he went to the uh, – he went to the NBA and played for the uh, Buffalo Braves, I think, for several years. But uh, those two gentlemen, uh, it's like Kareem said, <laughs> you couldn't move them. I mean, you could not get a rebound. Um, if, they, if they were in position, forget it. And uh, so, yeah, I, and just what's going on tragically in our, in our, in our city lately. Yes. I, 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 I really believe that if those two felt, well, both of them are deceased now. I really believe if they were – alive they would be here uh trying to help out in their in their hometown um i think I, you could tell the way they played each other that th- there was nothing but mutual respect between the two of them and they were awesome talents both of them i appreciate you calling and sharing that thank you very much for the yeah. call you got it yeah man you just looked at wes unseld and like the last thing you wanted to do it seemed like was disappoint that guy he just had that quiet demeanor about him. It's just like, yeah. No, isn't that what Kareem said? He was like six seven, six eight, but he could always get the rebound. He right. Would, he couldn't get one over him. The determination. Always always got that to see. Uh, let's take uh, 
the call of Jesus in Florida. You're here on the Rich Eisen Show. What's up, Jesus? Hey, Rich. How are you, my friend? Thanks for making this call today. What's on your mind? Oh, well, everything. You know, yesterday on my uh, Set in the Record Straight podcast, I talked a little bit of what was going on. Since you were on the air, I talked a little bit. And, uh, you know, I just want to say to the nation that's listening on NBCSN and that's watching that, you know, all lives matter, not just black lives, not just Jewish lives. I know yourself, you're you are Jewish descent. And, you know, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that there were people that, that suffered even in Auschwitz and, and anti-Semitism and all that. And, and to hear people like Max Kellerman and Mike Greenberg and yourself, Rich, you know, pouring your hearts out of what is going on with this world. And, 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 and by a guy, by George Floyd, who, who, who came, who was in school here, he came to school. He, he came to college in South Florida State College, where my brother is at, actually. And he was here during the 90s, and uh, there was a protest around here on Saturday, uh, just 15 minutes from where I live. And uh, it's, 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 it's been devastating, but I pray to the law enforcement officers and to everybody, everybody, that all lives matter, and we must unite as one nation. Because Hispanics, and I'm... I'm proud to say that I'm from Puerto Rico, and we see riots every day. We see protests every day outside the capital in San Juan, but it's it's been tough. Okay. And, and 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 you know we all should, should have a unit. We all should have a united front. And also, people like Barack Obama has to speak out. You know, I haven't heard nothing from President Obama lately either. You know, because he his voice matters as well. Well, I appreciate the call. Thanks very much, Jesus. 844-204-RICH is the number to dial. You're just hearing it in everybody's voice. Just like I, I think everybody would like the situation to calm down and just turn down the temperature a little bit here. You know, I certainly feel that way um, having uh, looked down at my, you know, phone in the middle of uh, commercial break and got another alert that there's another curfew tonight in the city of Los Angeles starting at 6 o'clock. You know, and then it does, it does for a lot of people, you know, need to step up in front of a microphone or whoever they are, wherever they may be, whatever their platform is. If they are white, they are Caucasian, speak out about it. Did you see um, Jason Kelsey's post today? I did not. He posted because uh, Deshaun Jackson spoke movingly in a uh, team Zoom you see Frank Reich, the Colts, posted the way that the coach started the team Zoom the other day. And the reason why, you know, it's important for people of all races to speak out is maybe that would help turn the temperature down a little bit. Unity is so much more crucial these days. And I know that that sounds trite, but... It really is on point. Speaking of Deshaun Jackson speaking as well, did you hear he said he if the, when the NFL comes back and there's no fans, he wants all players mic'd up? Deshaun Jackson said that. Yes, he does. I mean, I hope that happens. Oh. <laughs> that would be outstanding. Like we said before, if, if the game has to be shown on a minute delay, so be it. Yeah. I think Sam Darnold wished it was on a minute delay back in the, you know, seeing ghosts. <laughs> That's the whole thing is that, we, you know, we'd have to, if everybody's mic'd up. Oh, no, no. There's, you, get, you can't just go no. live, right? No, it would have to be some kind of delay. You have to be. We'd have to clean up the language, obviously. You can do a 10. Can't be, you know what I mean? Like, you got to be able sec- to. You could do 10. 10, 15 seconds. Well, if there's something like that Sam Darnold quote, you don't want that getting out there. I know that's a very sensitive subject of a lot of my friends and colleagues at NFL films and the end uh at espn but that was don't forget what a huge to do that was well, he's seeing ghosts out there against the seeing, patriots seeing ghosts out there. i mean which was an honest assessment i'm like i'm i don't know what the hell's going on yeah it happens 
We talked to a lot of players who said, you know, at one point or another, everyone sees ghosts. He says he wants the con. He said, it gets crazy, bro. I know in the trenches it gets crazy, and I know on the outside it gets crazy, too. The conversations we go back and forth on. I've heard some of those conversations <laughs> standing on the sidelines. Yeah. yeah. Um, Seen ghosts. Thank you very much, oh, Mike. Mike. Took me a second. I have to go back into the... I'm, see, I'm seeing the ghost of Mike Del Tufo's competency. This is great. <laughs> He's on fire today. The extra day off. Eh? No, I know the yeah. extra day. I wasn't off though. Well, the conver- I mean, the conversations I've heard. Well, you need, yes, you need the uh, old, you need the old Vince Vaughn earmuffs. Yeah, you could never, you could never go live. It would be insane. No, but don't you want to hear? But I understand what he's saying. And listen, the can't. best part, the best part of the Phil, Tiger, Brady, Peyton Manning, and again, as as the events of this world constantly keep spinning off the axis, that was just eight days ago. I know, it seems like. Or nine days ago. It just seems like that was like nine years ago. Man. It really was one week ago today we had Peyton Manning calling in just saying, hey, man, that was just yeah, a great. that was fun. <laughs> So sports are coming back, right? But and the if, best part about that was the mic'd up byplay between right, them. Exactly. But we, they were also four, you know, four guys who are who know that they're who know that they're mic'd up, and this is a conversation they're not going to go working blue. But, but the sport, best part, the best part was Phil explaining his shot, right, and then doing it, right, that chip shot. So the 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 way the equivalent of this would be. Like Brady in the 45 second clock saying, okay, so now it's like he turns into Romo. It's second and seven, Jim. And here's what I'm seeing I'm seeing my guy over there, out there. There's Mike Evans out there, but I'm looking across the way and I see Stephon Gilmore in a certain defense. So I'm about to audible. Give a listen. Like that would be the ultimate. Or it's LeBron being like, look, this guy can't guard me. So I'm going to take three dribbles to the left. That's what I'm I'm doing. I'm going to pump fake a three and then I'm going to go dunk on him. And then he goes and does it. As he's doing it. As he's, right. Literally as he's doing it. So what sport would be the coolest if there's no fans to have uh, the players? Oh, the NFL. Up? I mean, there's just no question in the NFL. Really? Oh, yeah. Ahead of the NBA? Of course. Why is that? I, I, I just think you've got 11 guys on each side. So there's 22. There's more... There's more opportunities the for there's so more like, opportunities. So like first down, you're gonna there's, have the linemen up, and then second with all the down, coaches the wide and everything. You're, you're, you're talking about Mike and 200 people up. That's a lot. How would that How would that taste, Mike? Oh, it'd be rough, but you could do it. You could do it. You'd have to mic up like 200 people. Yeah, if you mic up NBA, a, you, you, you know, you pick and choose. You maybe do what like you don't t- you tell this. You first tell of the all, guys the NBA the, on the court, you're gonna hear a lot of the guys over the other guys' mics. Football is the same way. You don't have to mic every lineman up. Yeah, you can mic up the center, yeah, the and center. The wide receivers yeah. and the DBs, uh, safety. I mean, it'd be. You got to do something. I mean, we're not going to have fans. And, and no one wants to hear fake crowd noise pumped in. That's, well, that's, that's been all over. People are like not into the fake crowd. And, and I'm not going to lie. I'm kind of, I don't want to do that. I wouldn't want to do that. Unless they're going to force us as mixers to probably do it. What if there we can get an app? People are going to want to do it. You can get an app. Where I'm sitting at home as a Jet fan, and I know this is a crucial third and ten, and my team's got to get off the field, and I'm hitting a button, and you as the the fans can make it louder. Can on I third pitch it downs, to Mr. Wonderful? On, th- on third downs, yeah, you pitch it to. Can I pitch it, Mr. 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 Wonderful? No, that would be great, Rich. I don't know how that that, that would work, but like you had fans at home, hey, season on ticket third holders down, on third downs. Boom. Season ticket on holders on third downs. Bust out your app. Yep. And you can affect the crowd noise in a game, and you so can sit at home. Season ticket holders, and you give twenty or thirty percent to that. The NFL would yeah, uh, wouldn't the NFL on average different. have have for what is on average the decibel level in a stadium, like your normal decibel level in a stadium. Let's see if I can find. It. I'm gonna say it's like so they know how they know how loud it could get in Seattle, how loud it gets in Arrowhead, and all thirty. I guess in all 31 stadiums, or now all 30 stadiums, since two teams are going to be sharing the same stadium yeah. in New York and Los Angeles. So on average, football stadiums are between 80 and 90 decibels. Well, nah. some some teams, you know, raise that curve a little Terrible, bit. Yeah. So it's pretty loud. So whatever that is, you can 
based on average what the decibel level is in Seattle, you're one of the 12 sitting at home. You're hitting a button, and you can make it louder on third downs. And the NFL just makes sure they have an actual, I'm serious, an actual official sitting in somebody's office who handles the audiovisual in the stadium that they're not like screwing around on purpose. Don't you think that would make some news and get fans involved? And well, be it would great. be cool, but I don't know how you, you test that technology in the next three months. So we got time. When you, you got nothing but time. When you hit it, it frequency <laughs> goes into the stadium, and then that is controlled. I don't know. It's hard to figure out. You're my sound expert. I mean, is it, it could possible? totally be done. I mean, you could totally do it. A hundred percent. Why don't you get the copyright on that right now? By the way, ninety decibels is about the sound of a lawnmower. Yeah, it's loud. I mean, we've it's been louder. on the field. It's we've louder been on the field. It's loud. It's louder well, in Seattle. Seattle, Seattle was in the 100. 140. Kansas City is about Kansas, 140. Yeah. So it's louder in different stadiums. Correct. I'm just saying average. So that's what I'm saying is that on average, I'm sure the NFL and certainly can can get that verified. But here's the problem: how loud it is in these stadiums. You got to give the visiting team a little bit of. You have to give them both. What you are you talking split. about? Oh, so so the Cowboys fans you get the split. Average, travel, yes. travel. Steelers yes. fans Steelers and travel. You figure out what that algorithm is. Yeah. No, I mean you got it. You got to do like a seventy thirty. So one hundred and thirty decibels is a, a jackhammer or an ambulance siren. Mooch and I used to love going on the field and testing that. I would sit out there with the, my meter, and Mooch loved that. Steve Mooch Mariucci loved the meter. Loved the meter. He loved jet, everything. Jet yeah. planes taking off are one hundred and twenty decibels. And Seattle and Kansas City are louder than are that. Louder oh, than yeah. that. Remember they were they, yeah, they did the uh, I believe it. They did that like fight off of who was louder. Yeah. I believe it. Crazy. I would I, I wouldn't mind that. Got a lot of time on our hands to figure it out, yeah, I'll tell you that. We got, we got some time. Okay, eight four four two oh four Rich, more of your phone calls when we come back on the Rich Eisen show on this Tuesday. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> You actually take the the SPL, the sound pressure meet. No, 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 no. Sorry, you're, I'm now you're showing off. Now you're flexing. So but what we does would it? go out. Steve used to love when I'd walk out there, and we'd actually go in the stadium, and I would turn it towards the fans, and then t- like away. So the NFL must have those. Oh, a hundred percent. They're they're testing stuff like that. Of course you are. What do you think of that? How do you do? I think that they should. Each team should just designate one person, a member of the staff, to be in charge of the crowd noise. But it can't go any higher than the highest recorded in your stadium. Well, here's the issue as well, is that if there are no fans, you'll be able to hear the signals plain as day. Oh, yeah. Oh, Everybody the, the signals. audibles, the Omahas, all that stuff. The Plain as day. Yeah, plain as day. Who was it that Jared Goff said? Didn't he get some actress was the, the Howie Berry? Jared Goff, yo, Halle yeah, Berry, Berry was Halle one Berry, of his yeah. audible well, you calls. You hear that. They, you know, Belichick's uh, significant other, Linda, is getting yeah. got many shout-outs yeah, from Linda, Brady. Linda, Linda, yeah. We're going to hear all that stuff anyway, which is going to be cool. Not if you're trying to actually win a football game. Change your signals up every yeah, day. Yeah, you're going to really have on. to get creative We're going to find out how good these coaches are. Yep. I'm just kidding. No, you are. You're going to – you have to change them up. Right. Speaking of up, just to say this right here. When the show's over, you may have to help me get up. <laughs> oh, Rich. I feel bad for yeah, you, Rich. I mean, are you, you going to be like Kellen Winslow? We're going to have to walk, yeah, walk yeah. you to your car? Yeah. Walk you to your car? Yeah. Maybe. Oh. I'm not kidding you. I don't know how I'm doing this right now. What do you have for... Um... Everything. Okay. Everything. Oh. I'm sorry, Everything. are you doing like... Heat, ice, are you going? Like, I've been how icing are you? this entire show. Yeah, what did you do ice back? What, what, you, what did you pick no, up I know, I know. Floor? I'm just saying, oh. well, it's been three hours. I mean, uh, uh, it's not ice right be, now. It, do you yeah. have one of those uh, massage guns by chance? You those, need one of those. Uh, yeah. He needs it. Yeah. yeah. You got one? Yeah. That, I got one of them. Yeah, those are, those are, those are big. Very good. They're, they're great. I know. <laughs> Poor Rich. I don't know how you, I mean, I know. I, back. That's not good. No good. I've had a bad back. No good. It's not fun. Mike, uh, is it true that if you just take a baseball and roll it on your yeah, back? You oh, here you go, Rich. I have the baseball right here. Here you go, Rich. How's the plantar fasciitis doing? It's much better since, you know. <laughs> you rolled the baseball. The pandemic's it. taking care of it, Mike. Thanks for asking. <laughs> I need to know.
I mean, while we're going down uh, this road here of talking about fan noises, as Deshaun Jackson saying he wouldn't mind having old players mic'd up for an NFL game if there are no fans. You know, what if you know when there when there are no fans because there will not be fans, or I guess what they're the NFL is talking about potentially having uh, 10, 20 20 20 percent. Like okay, that. you're gonna you're gonna hear all the audibles. Like, every last one of them. Oh, yeah. I'm wondering if, like, hand signals are going to be new. As opposed to the cadence, you know, screaming out all sorts of ice cream, all that sort of business. Yeah, I think teams are just going to figure it out. kind of adjust. that, man. Yeah. <laughs> That's the latest Zoom. Okay, here's what we're doing, guys. Cadence. <laughs> Let's get everybody back on the field first, right? Yeah. This is the month for that. We'll find out this month. We'll see who's up this is the month, right? This is the month in which we're going to hear. Uh, decisions are going to be made. The NHL, the month. NBA, yeah. Major League Baseball. Yeah. The NFL is we're, we're They They're don't kinda, have to make any decisions uh, yeah. except for when players are going to be able to get back on the field. We're 100 days from the start of the season. 100 night. days. It's wild. From Deshaun Watson and the Texans visiting Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs. Wow. I can't wait. Yeah. Like, good know. Lord, that would be let's amazing. Hope. Let's hope, man. Uh, let's go to Debbie in Arlington, Texas, home of the Texas Rangers, and also uh, right there where uh, the Dallas Cowboys have their stadium. What's going on there, Debbie? You there, Debbie? She's up. Oh. Debbie. She's, Debbie's now up, and she's now out. Put her back on hold. Yep. Um, let's go to Lisa in Kansas City. What's up, Lisa? Hi, Rich. Um, I really appreciate your show. I think that you're a fantastic uh, broadcaster. I appreciate you saying that. Thank you. I just wanted to say um, quick. Well, I don't know if it's going to be quickly. I'll try. Go for it. <laughs> I think that all these in the uh, NFL teams and NBA teams, all these teams that are putting out these statements, I, I just honestly believe it's just so disingenuous. This has been going on forever. And, and pardon me, because I'm going to get a little um, emotional about this. This has been going on forever. We said people are being killed by police. Nobody believed it. We got phones with cameras on them. We said, see, people are getting killed by police. Yeah, but what happened before you started filming? So we saw this man on the ground watching his life drain out of his body, and maybe that's what it took. But Callum... Colin Kaepernick told us years ago, this is why I'm kneeling. This is why I'm sitting. He actually started sitting. And a vet told him to kneel in respect. So Nate he did Boyer. that, but that still wasn't enough. And he lost his career over this. So now all the, and, and we need, I'm, I'm from Kansas City. I love my chief. But I, I really hate the fact that we traded Marcus Peters because he spoke out and he kneeled. And, and everybody knows that's why he was traded to the Rams. So I used to work for the Chiefs Radio Network. I'm in broadcasting, too. We had a, a restaurant who would cater for us because we couldn't go to the, to the games. Well, they would always give us great food like steaks and prime rib and things like that. Well, they were very upset about this. They said they weren't going to feed us anymore because of the whole situation with Colin Kaepernick and how the Chiefs didn't respond like they wanted them to. So... They finally decided to feed us, but instead of prime ribs and steaks, they would feed us Salisbury steak and, and hamburgers. So people knew this was going on. They just didn't want to address it. They were upset that they were being, you know, that they were being shown these things and that this was really going on. They didn't want to believe it. Now, after all these years, this is happening again. Or we could see the life drain out of this man's body. And I'm an African-American woman. He was born and raised in the middle of Kansas. So, believe it or not, I didn't really experience a lot of racism until I came to Kansas City because I was from a smaller town. I was an athlete. Everybody knew me. But because everybody knew me and my family, it was okay. But if they don't know you, I, I, won't, even tell, I won't even begin to tell you what I've experienced. I'm a law-abiding citizen, but I'm not going to tell you what I experienced because time's running out with the police, which I still can't believe because there's no reason for them to treat me like this. 
but nevertheless, I just think all of this is disingenuous. It should have happened years ago. Colin Kaepernick should have had a job years ago. And now all of this coming up now saying, oh, this is really horrible. I just think it's completely disingenuous. Well, Lisa, I appreciate the people who are helping and who are, you know, who are on the street yes. and standing up for this. But as far as the NFL teams and the sports teams, disingenuous, 100 percent. Lisa, I hope uh, you calling into the show and saying that has been helpful for you. I appreciate the call. Thank you. Thanks. You got it. That's Lisa in Kansas City. Is Debbie in Arlington, Texas, back on the phone? Let's make sure. One of those people. I'm here. There you go, Debbie. (laughs) What's going on? Not a lot in Arlington right now since sports are shut down. Mm -hmm. But um, I just wanted to say I miss my baseball. And I think that these two sides need to get together. Oh, boy. You bet. And I don't. I don't know that either one is more at fault than the others, but I think the players look worse because the few that that have been vocal that I've heard, it seems to me the impression is that I'll risk my life for my full salary, but it's not worth it. If well, it's not everything that I should get. Well, I think what and they're I, saying, Debbie, it, you know, and and thank you again for for holding on and and sticking in there and for the call. Thank you because uh, we're got a couple minutes left here. Um, again, the players are saying that they'll play for what they talked about in March. They feel that the uh, baseball is switching up on them now that it's uh, it's time to put put action here into a plan and there's no fans and they think that the game's been switched up on them and the owners are saying what's happened in March is no longer applicable and I think that's what they're saying that they were willing to do this in a prorated scale baseball's not like saying okay you want prorated how about like for two two hours (laughs) 50 games obviously I'm being facetious with two hours but I think that that's basically it and wouldn't it be great if July hits and all sports are back, and we have unity in the streets. Are, they, are we talking about unicorns flying? Unfortunately, probably. Let's go Matt in Buffalo, New York. You're here on the Rich Eisen Show. What's up, Matt? Uh, hey, Rich. I had two things. Uh, thanks for taking my call. First, I wanted to say thank you to you for uh, being on the air and uh, saying what you say about how, you know, sports and bringing people together. And I know our country is really going through it right now. And uh, second, I just wanted to give a shout out to the people of Buffalo, New York, to all the Bills fans, the Sabres fans. Uh, You know, Buffalo, (laughs) we're going through it, too. And I hate to see it on the news. I just want everyone to, you know, the Bills fans, the Sabres fans out there to to use a little of the love towards the teams and maybe just, you know, there's Bills fans or Sabres fans out there. Then your neighbors, you're out there. And I'm all for protests. I'm not all for the violence and the looting. And I hate to see it in my city. I hate to see it in the nation. Of course. And that's kind of why I was calling Rich. I just, I hope you know how much you mean to me. And there's a lot of people out there that listen to you religiously. And I just think during these times, you mean a lot to people. I appreciate and you I just saying want to thank that, you man. Wow. A lot. And like I said to the people of Buffalo, you know, just show a little love out there. That's, that's why I'm calling. I, I hate to see what I see on the news and the violence, the destruction. I think uh, Bill stands, Sabre stands, Bison stands can be better than this, and, and we are. Appreciate and, that. And, again, Rich, thank you. And a little shout-out to Brockman and Terry Funk. There you go. All right, thank <laughs> you, Matt. Matt. Appreciate good, that. Brother. Buffalo, New York. We're the only uh, destruction involving plywood should be in the parking lots before games. People diving off of trucks. Well done. We don't condone that sort of thing. <laughs> Just trying to bring a little bit of levity here. And I hope the Bills, man, in 100 days get ready for their weekend opener uh, against their toughest competition in the New England Patriots. Wait a minute. Oh, nope. nope. No, 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 no. no. Wow. Wow. That short straw of visiting Buffalo to start the season was handed to the Jets. My bad. (laughs) Jets. The Pats are playing two a week one. They are, aren't they? Or if it's probably if it's It's. I don't know. We'll see. I don't know. 
But again, just to uh, reiterate, um, let's just stay peaceful, please. Please. You stay peaceful, you take the power away from those who are trying to divide. Really are. Peaceful, staying peaceful, that's your power. That's our power, is being peaceful. If you cannot stay peaceful, stay home and figure out a way to vote. That's the way to do it. But staying peaceful is the most powerful thing that can be done. You take the power away from those who are trying to wield it right now for forces of negativity. That's my last words on that subject. I want to thank Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Dr. Uh, Todd Boyd for calling into this program. Ed Reed will call in tomorrow. We'll figure out, uh, we'll inform you on our Twitter feed at Rich Eisen Show for our guest list for the rest of the week. Obviously, conditions, uh, what's going on in the world. Uh, we'll, we'll change our guest list every now and then. But for everyone out there who have taken in this show, I just want to say the message of unity and love is from me and from all of us to you and hopefully your family. And we will see you on Wednesday's edition of the Rich Eisen Show on all the family of networks that are out there. And with thanks again to our friends at NBCSN. We'll see you Wednesday.